Hey, what's up guys? In this video, you're going to see a really powerful three hour coaching session that I did with a handful of land investors. Before we dive into this video, I need to let you know that our Leah scholarship, three out of the five spots have already been taken for the month of June. We've got two spots left. Just last week, we had over 50 people apply. This is the best way to get involved in the Leah group coaching program which is the best way to build a six or seven figure land investing business. We've quite literally taken the land investing industry by storm. We've got folks that are getting insane results, just 60, 90, 120 days inside the program. If you guys are inside of our Discord community, you've already seen this. Go to landinvestor.co slash scholarship or go click the link down below. If you're looking to build a badass land investing business that buys back your time, that uncaps your earning potential and allows you to live the life that you want, the life that you deserve, Click that down below. Let's get into the video. Peace. Goal of today's call. So this is going to be a Q&A based call. Um, you know, and then previously we've done a lot of these where they're based off of uh, a certain topic. But today we're going to go, we're just going to riff. And so I'm going to let you guys kind of open fire on me and any questions that you have wherever you're at, right? You could be half a decade in this business. You could be five minutes into this business. All questions are welcome. Uh, there's no such thing as a bad question. Uh, so we'll get things kicked off here in a little bit. Ben, what's up, my man? How are you doing? How's your week? Good, good. I took a little uh, took a little time off to take my boys and uh, my wife to Palm Springs in the desert because it's been oh, nice. cloudy as hell right in SoCal. So, dude, what part of uh, what part of Southern California are you in? Pasadena. Pasadena. Okay, cool. Yeah. Are you in uh, uh, Palm Springs right now? No, I just got back. I'm in the I'm in my office today. Nice man. It's very holy in there, very bright. <laughs> yeah. I, know. I, got the, I, got the nice, I got the blurred windows in the background. It's yeah. Not, but it's a good how's uh, how's everything in your land business this week? Anything to report on? Um, you know, it I've I've hit that lull and you know, when I when I push pot when I paused my last mailer between when I sent the the new one. So I, the last mailers I'd sent was probably was May 6th and I didn't get that many responses back. And so I just sent my next round of mailers about 2020, let's see, 2,400 maybe Okay. last Friday. Um, I meant to send, you know, try to get ready to send another one today. I'll probably be bleak in the Monday, yep. uh, but you know, I'm kind of trying to hit that. Yeah. I'm trying to hit the, right now. My goal is around 5,000 a month. Um, and, uh, you know, just continue, you know, looking at markets, finding yeah, ones yeah. I like, getting them priced and mailers out the door to try and get some information that feedback loop started. And, uh, yeah. yeah. How's, uh, how's it going with the market selection VA that's helping you? Yeah, good. I mean, he's, he's pretty, uh, he, it's a pretty simple task I've got him started yeah. with. Um, I'm still trying to get a grasp on, you know, I, I think for personally, as far as pricing markets go, yeah. I think I need to be a little, just a bit more judicious and being like okay this is not a you know homogenous market it's yeah. going to take me a while i've got plenty of other markets i need to look through it's really should only take me like five or ten minutes not you know 30 minutes an hour looking right. at every single comp like i need to it's so i'm trying to get that level of level of uh knowledge quicker right yeah. facing quicker and then i you know that i record myself and i think he'll be able to handle it I just uh yeah take some time he's only been with you for what about a week now yeah a week or two okay. yeah. yeah yeah that's fair yeah, it's definitely it's one thing to figure out, hey, property selling here. It's another thing to be like, hey, can Ben actually price this? But yeah, but once, yeah. once you get that dialed in, it'll be helpful. What about that deal with the, the septic system? Any word on that one? Uh, I called a soil scientist on Monday. Yeah, she, uh, you know, she or Monday or Tuesday. And she's like, yeah, I'm all, you know, I'm, I'm running behind. I, well, I, you know, I'm trying to get to it, but if not today, I'll let you know when I do. Yeah, you know, I, I said, okay, fine, I'll give it a couple of days. So I wasn't contacting me. I'm at the point where it's just like, you know what? I it has been perked positively before. Yeah. For a, and it's I think it was like for at least a one bedroom cabin or whatever. Yeah. But the way it was perked, it was perked in different locations, not in the one location for the building site. So that's what I'm getting her to do. So, you know, I need you to put perks the six holes in the building site. That way I can get approval of at least a three bedroom septic tank yeah. system. Um, but at this point, like I'm just, I mean, I'm looking at all the comps and everything, it's like I'm, I'm at the point where it's like I should, I'm, I, well, I'm asking about the um, funding just now. It's like I want to get this into the to the funders, get it, a, you know, get get their blessing because even at the you know 
the downside, I I think you're still you're still it's still profitable. Like yeah. even if you're only making you know a downside, I think you're making thirty thousand dollars. It's not doubling your money. Give, give but, the group context. What are the numbers on the deal? If if it doesn't park or if it doesn't park for a three bedroom, and then if it does, yeah. So, I mean, right now it's it's five acres. So buying it for around not just a little over nine thousand acre, forty seven thousand. So it is around. It's it's five point two. So call it call it nine thousand an acre. Um, I mean, you're I, you're not even like the the comps that aren't on this is the lake front it's on a little um it's on a little vein that's coming across it's like a little more of a of a fishing stream than as opposed to like true lake frontage but um you know, the fantastic views you know the even so like i said even the comps that are not on the lake that are on a hill and like sh- weird topography and everything those are selling for 15 to 18,000 an acre. Yeah. Yeah. So that like the up, the upside is tremendous, right? Like there's, there's comps that are selling for 36,000 an acre, <laughs> 30 to 36,000 an acre. It's like, there's, there's enough to upside, especially at this price point Yeah, that I think it's just worth, you know, closing just, to, just so that way I get control of the property and, um, you know, make, you know, the seller won't back out or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't stay in limbo too long. And when I tell people too, I mean, you know, use your discretion. I don't think anyone here would be obnoxious with bombarding deal funders with every lead they get, but my rule of thumb is just send it. Even if you don't have the contract yet or even closed yet, I would always just get it sent to them. And even if there could be a fork in the road, like, Hey, it does perk. It doesn't perk. You know, run them through that scenario. I think they also want to get eyes on it beforehand too. So I would send that. I'd send that after this call really. Um, so, yeah, that's that's why I tried. To, I was I was uh, pestering them to get on the air table because I filled it out yesterday. And oh, because that was the issue was the air table. Yeah, yeah. To be to, in full candor, I absolutely hate the new air table system they put together. It just gives <laughs> everyone problems. Yeah, but now that you have it set up, it should be a little bit easier. Well, for yeah. everyone that's on the call here, sorry for getting deep in the weeds there, but uh, maybe that was interesting to some people. Interesting to me. Um, looks like we only have. Probably about a third of the RSVPs on the call. So we're not going to wait for the other two thirds. We'll just kind of crack into it. Before we do, as you guys know, this is a quote unquote happy hour. I'm drinking a zero sugar lemonade. So cheers, everyone. Get your get your drink cracked open. And we're going to party it up here tonight. Uh, before before we dive into it, um, I know we got a mix of Leah members and non-Leah members on here. Uh, as you guys know, last month we released our scholarship program for our group coaching program. We had, uh, I think, 107 people apply. We selected 10 members. We're doing it again this month. We're reducing the quantity. We're doing five folks. And so far, we've already had three uh, that have been granted the scholarship. So we've got two more spots for the month of June. I'll put the link inside the chat if anyone wants to submit an application there. Um, The way we're going to do this is we're really just going to go based off of the hand raise. So you guys can raise your hand inside here. And we'll pick on you and we'll go through it. One thing that I do ask, a lot of times this can be like a weird monologue where I'm talking to myself. If I drop some fire, give me emojis. If I don't drop some fire, give me a thumbs down. Let me know. Let me know what you guys think of what gets thrown around in here today. Um, So whoever has questions first, raise your hand here in Slack. Again, no bars hold. We'll talk about anything here. Let's let it rep. Who's got questions first? Who's the fearless one to go first? Take it away. I'll just be over here drinking my lemonade. Take it away, Ben. Yeah, I've got um, I've got a question on the deal. So my first deal I bought, I closed last week. Um, it's a twelve thousand dollar purchase, you know, plus title. I'm at thirteen thousand all in. Yeah. Uh, comps uh, have sold, you know, twenty five to thirty thousand. It's two two point two acres. So, um, and these are two to three acres. Comps are in twenty five thirty thousand range. But there's also a ton on market as well. Um, some of a lot of them have kind of weird topography. Of course, my realtor like, yeah, they're not the not the best location. They kind of fall right off into a cliff. Uh, it's in a, in a it's in a subdivision, and he lives at the subdivision, so I I, I trust his judgment. Yeah, uh, uh, I did get a photographer out there, and he was like, well, and who's experienced with land investing is like, hey, like there is room for a home site on it, but you're gonna have to blow up the berm to let you know, create a level flat ground, and then your site falls off pretty dramatically so like okay well you know even if it's you know i'm pricing at twenty five thousand or so even if i you have to take a haircut like you know that that's fine um i did so the question that i'm getting to 
as far as like as far as neighbor letters and neighbor question like how should I go about there's one neighbor that owns the vacant lot next door and his homestead on the other right. on next door too like that's I think that's really the only neighbor that I could see having interest everything else, everyone else is just vacant land I may do the neighbor on the other side who's also vacant to see whether it combined maybe there's a better home buildable home site but um that's the question is talking about your know, neighbor letters approaching approaching neighbors and, and this you know is it, is it better to send a letter or just skip trace and just call them right away and be like hey I, I just purchased this I'll give it to you you know give it to you for for a good deal and yeah it's a good question man it's something that I I've been for years trying to crack the code on neighbor letters and what I came to the conclusion of is frankly I hate the neighbor letters I love a neighbor phone call though. I just think it like, right. and it's just, yeah, I mean, if you think about it from the view of the neighbor, it's kind of off-putting if you get someone that's trying to solicit to sell you, the, it's just kind of weird. Um, and so I found that like, it's a much better conversation when we call them. Uh, you gotta be careful soliciting stuff through text. So if you're doing that at scale, like be careful there. But yeah, we've had way better luck with calls. And also you just get to that yes or no faster. Usually yeah. the way we position it in a neighbor letter, uh, which you might not apply here, but we would usually, we, we'd bump the price or like we'd start at a higher retail price and give them a little bit of a discount in that letter. Um, but this, you can just kind of get a yes or no immediately. You don't have to do that mumbo jumbo with the price. So yeah, yeah. I, I would use uh direct skip and yep. just give them a yep. call. Got that. I think that's got the best that signed up. I got, I got the neighbor and fell already off of that. So I'm, I'm very, very afraid to go. I just want to do that. And that's something that we actually have our disposition manager do too. So she'll go pull, skip mm -hmm. trace call and text the neighbor letters or text the neighbors. We still don't get that many deals from it, but frankly, yeah. it's been way better than our neighbor letters. So yeah. Yeah. And okay. for a deal like that, that's probably the best angle. And I would say, frankly, I mean, this is your, your first deal. Yeah. 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 First deal. Um, it sounds like there's a little bit of hair on it. There's still margin there, but just um, from a general principle standpoint, get that thing out the door, right? Yeah. First deal is yeah. proof of concept, not, not to put a lot of money in your pocket. So don't hold on to it. If you find out that even 25 is not, not going to be attainable, have no fear. I just, start okay. yeah. yeah. Or yeah. even if the neighbor says, Hey Ben, I'll give you 19, five. I'd, I'd support I would be, I'd be ecstatic with that, with yeah. that, right? Like pays, pays for the initial marketing, pays for the education and just break like you said, proof of concept, keep it rolling. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Well, you'll have to keep it. us in the loop as that unfolds, but yeah, for anyone here, uh, neighbor letters versus calling the neighbor, use direct skip, call them or text them. And the texting stuff you got to be a little more careful with if yeah. you're doing it at scale. A one off text ain't going to kill you. But yeah, good question. Um, cool. Who else is next on the docket? Who's got questions? Jay, you look like you're deep in thought over there. Yes. <laughs> Sumner, this is, this is Donald. I have a question for you if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah. Um, as you're going through um, looking into subdivisions and trying to pull, based on the subdivision name, you find that in some cases, a lot of subdivision or a lot of parcels don't actually have the name on the subdivision. Yeah. Because I, I kind of did an experiment myself where I was trying to pull by the name. And then I went and put a polygon around, but I'm pretty confident was the subdivision. I went very meticulous on it. Yep. And it worked out that I got 42% uh, came out with the name on it. And it was like almost, yeah, 60% or almost 60% had no name on it. Um, but it looks like they're in the same subdivision. Okay. In that case, would, would you suggest then using the polygon as opposed to the um, subdivision name to pull your data? Yeah, yeah. so uh, a good litmus test here first too, is I will say the subdivision search tool on data trees is certainly finicky. Um, to go test the reason though, because it seems like a subdivision would be logical and they typically are, but we've seen weird ones where you think it's all one and it really is a separation and they are different subdivisions or unrestricted and subdivisions. So you can always go check the legal description to cross-reference just to make sure that you really are mailing to the same subdivision. But yeah, I would say a third of the time we end up having to use the polygon. What we'll see too is in some cases, the subdivision tool inside data tree will pull, like you said, you know, maybe two thirds or half of the actual real data that's there. And it's pretty obvious that the rest of the subdivision is just not getting pulled. You also see in some cases in data tree, it's the same subdivision, but it's got like seven different variations of the same name, right? And so it can, right. it can definitely be a little bit finicky. So yeah, I, I would have no fear with the polygon, but just to test your reason, I would challenge you to go look at the legal descriptions. There can't, that's rare, but you can be surprised at what looks like one I, subdivision is not one subdivision. So I'll just test that. That's a surefire yeah. way to, to know. Yeah, I did. I downloaded the subdivision legal description 
and it okay. shows, I mean, a full slew of legal description. It shows the subdivision name within the subdivision, within the okay. legal description. Yeah. But a lot of the ones which have a legal description that shows the subdivision, they don't have it in the sub subdivision right. column or data. Yeah, data yeah, yeah. 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 So I'm intended, I, you know. Yeah, I think your 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 thinking is right in terms of pulling the legal description. And frankly, I mean, like if you look at everything in this business, this is just a common thread that we see from start to finish of like this fragmentization of all of the data sets. And there's a lot of inaccuracy and in, and this even this still applies to the data providers that we use. So yeah, I have no fear using the the polygon. And heck, in the worst case, let's say you do pull 10% of an additional area that you don't want in your data set. It's a very small cost you're going to incur for mispricing those potentially, where they might be they might be well priced. So yeah, I mean, and it might it might help some of your team here. That what I've noticed is if you also pull the legal description, you'll find out pretty quick if it's in a different subdivision. Yep. Yep. Uh, and you can just leave it out of your mail. If you get 10% that are not in the same legal description, you can just leave it out of your mail. Yeah. That's kind of what I'm seeing. You know? Yeah. Yeah, it's always going to be the source of truth is the, the legal description. And I, I don't know where the disconnect with data tree comes with the subdivision filter and the legal description. I'm not quite sure why that's the case. You think the two would communicate, but it can be a, a bit of a disconnect. But yeah, I think your thinking yeah. is sound there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Donald, how's I, I noticed else? that it, oh, go ahead. Uh, it's, it's gone reasonable. I, I joined your program quite a while back, but then yeah. I, I got really busy with a lot of stuff going on. I'm still working full time. And we ended up, I'm in California too. Our friend yep. Stan, he's in, he's in Pasadena. Uh, we ended up selling our house and, and buying another one. And I just got busy moving in and moving out. I, I kind of wasn't able to keep up with this, but I'm trying to get back into it again. Yep. Um, but uh, I, I have really my, I'm still kind of where Ben is. I'm trying to do my first deal. Yep. And I have one under contract um, and I had a buyer interested in buying it and they were supposed to close this past week and they didn't close. They had some hold up. So I'm kind of waiting yep. to see what happens there. I'm sending it with a raise group, so he's he's kind of working with this with the buyer to see if they can yep. buy it. But it's under contract. You, I, I go would ahead. you mind walking through the group just for context on what that deal looks like? Sure. Yeah, I, I started out maybe wrongly so, but I started out looking at infill lots in Florida. Yep. Um, it's easier from my perspective. It was easier to kind of see the layout and and, and the homogeneity that they're all kind of the same. I know you said it's it's kind of a it's a lazy way of going about it, but I started there just to kind of learn, and, yeah. and I ended up sending some mailers, and I got a, a deal in I think it's in Lake County in Florida, paid uh, at least in the in the purchase agreement it's uh, approximately fifteen thousand five hundred to buy, and talking to the realtor he he guessed it was worth a little over forty maybe forty two forty three, so we listed it at um, thirty nine five we listed it at. And a, a buyer, or a build, it's actually a builder came in to put an offer on it. I think he put the offer at 34.9. And it was my first one. So I said, okay, let's just accept it and, and try and get this done. He put $1,000 down as his deposit, which is good. Yeah. And it's been kind of dragging a little bit. It's taken a little bit while for him to close. He was supposed to close two weeks ago. He wanted to do some, um, he, he did like a, a, a site survey. He was concerned that there was an encroachment from one of the neighbors where he was going to build. So he did end up in a site survey. He wanted more time for that. And then he did some water analysis. I don't think he did a park test, but on the maps, you can kind of see what looks like a possible stream that runs across the site. And I could see it and I was aware of it. And uh, he wanted to do an analysis on that. He did his analysis and apparently he's okay with it. Yep. So he was planning to move forward and we were going to close this week, but then something happened and, and he didn't close. So I kind of got to wait and see what happens. We might end up having to relist it off the market right now because he has it, he has it on the contract. Okay. Uh, we may end up having to list it again, but that would be my first one if it, if it closes, but it's, it's kind of dragging a little bit here on the last bit. Oh, but uh, yeah, the purchase price, I think I told you, he's buying it at 34, nine, I think he, he offered 34, nine, yeah. somewhere there. So I uh, make, I make close to 15,000 on it, maybe. Um, the, the realtor got, has got to get paid and then there'll be my closing costs and the closing costs on the sell side. So um, I'll probably make somewhere around 14 to 15 on that one if it, if it closes. Not a bad so first not, deal by any means. Yeah. Not, yeah, not a bad good. first yeah, deal. Just, well, the thing yeah. is too, I mean, yeah, even if this guy falls through, I think there's probably a world where if you relist it, you might even fetch a little bit more than what he's got it under contract at. So no harm, no foul. Did that thousand dollars? Is that like a true uh, earnest money deposit that went hard? Would you keep that? Well, I met, I talked about the Ritter when he started pushing back and slowing things down a little bit. You yeah. know, he wanted to do the um, 
because he'd gone past his his point of his contingency, his whatever that contingency is where he loses his deposit. He'd gone past that point, and then he wanted to do this um, site survey, uh, which he did and turned out fine. And I, I was asking the realtor about it. What, what happens if he doesn't go through? And he said, well, you can, you can hold the deposit, but it, there's a certain amount of paperwork you got to go through, and it takes time to work all that out, and you end up in a little bit of a battle. Yeah, I'm inclined to, if he doesn't want to, just tell us if he doesn't want to do it, give him back his thousand dollars and list it again. We can't list them if we get him out of the way, basically. Yeah. yeah. And if I try to hold on to the positive, it'll just take a lot longer. Yeah. So I, I'm inclined to just give, give him back the thousand dollars and get it listed again and try and get it sold. That's kind of my my vision on. I think you got the right mindset there. Yeah. I think yeah. I've had deal funders in the past that we've worked with that wanted nickel and dime buyers over a five hundred dollar earnest money deposit. I think. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Just go list the property again and get it sold. What you'll have to keep us in the loop is that as that deal uh, goes through, whether it's with this file buyer or a new buyer. Um, what's your experience yeah. working with the, the realtor? It's been it's been good. Uh, he's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. I, I got his name from um, I can't remember the guy's last name. Dan. You might see him on some of these social media platforms. Um, he buys quite a lot of. He does the kind of same thing. He buys a lot of um, info lots in Florida, but he builds on them himself. But he has a realtor. He recommended him, um, and he kind of might be the best, but he covers pretty much all of Florida. This this particular realtor, he has, and he does all in all lots, right? All land, uh, vacant land, he does. Doesn't do any houses really. Yeah. So he's been pretty good, and he's you know responsive, and he's always sends somebody out there to take pictures and put up signs and that kind of stuff. So he, he's he's pretty good. But uh, I'm I'm inclined to move away. I don't know. I, I did send more mailers to Florida, but I'm inclined to move away from Florida and kind of follow your direction and, and move out and get bigger stuff. So I just sent an email actually to, to Texas, one of the counties in Texas, and I'm kind of hoping I get a better better feedback on that. So yeah. we'll, we'll see what happens there. Yeah, but you have to keep us in the loop as that mailer unfolds as well. Yeah, Florida, I mean, I know there's some people that love it. I've got a real real bone to pick with Florida. It's a bloodbath out there for land investors, at least in my experience. But it looks like you got a pretty yeah. good deal, so, so kudos. Yeah, I heard you saying it's your least favorite place to go. And, yeah. Uh, but uh I don't think I know this about it. It's just you can see the layout. You can see all the lots. It's easier. To, it's much easier to price. It's easier to kind of work out what you're doing. And I felt at least I could start there. And, and I sent some matters to a couple of different counties. Um, and I was mostly using the Polygon tool to kind of just loop them all in and, and get pricing on it and send it off. But okay, guys, I'm not going to use a really simple tool that we oh. use on Redfin. Uh, just a very quick exercise. Mr. Pazmino. Markets, when you have multiple markets, especially if they're like a chair. You gotta, you gotta mute your screen. I think you're playing one of my videos in the background. Oh, it's sorry. I, I thought I thought I heard two things. So weird, on. weird inception going on a YouTube video of me. <laughs> yeah, I was going through the course while, like, right before I hopped in, I got <laughs> kind of carried away. <laughs> yeah. Well, cool, Donald. Anything? Any additional questions we can help work through on that one? Uh, no, that was uh, no. I, I'm just kind of waiting on this guy. At some point, I got to pull the plug on him. I probably got to yeah. tell my realtor if he's not going to close it, let's just get out of it and move on and list it. Um, that that's kind of where I'm at. So I might come back at some point and ask yeah. advice on that. If he keeps dragging out, I just need to cut him off. Yeah. Um, the on, the only other thing I wanted to ask about was I asked about the the subdivision not showing up. Yeah. Um, do do you find that the polygon tool? Do you try and stay away as much as possible from the Polygon tool? I'm trying to use it. I like it. I, mm -hmm. I think it's, uh, if, if you don't think there's any major problem with it, I zoom in pretty tight. Right? I, yeah. I keep really close as much as I can to the subdivision and, and try and work it out. If yeah, no, I, yeah, no no bone to pick with the, sub, with the Polygon tool. I think it's one of those things where it's like, know thyself. So some people are really sloppy and they just, <laughs> and so if we're talking to a beginner and I can't see them do it, well, a subdivision tool is probably going to be a little more reliable because I just don't know how how tight they're going to draw their polygons. But yeah, there's there's no, nothing inherently wrong with it. There's just a little more margin of error depending on how the person's using it. But yeah, if you're zooming in, if you're taking your time, you're not rushing through it, but it's same, same. And in fact, again, as we can see, someone's going to actually gather data that you're not going to get through the subdivision tool. So we use the polygon a ton. I, I would never stray anyone away from using it. Um, okay. So yeah, I think you're totally fine there. Yeah, the, the, the one thing I noticed is you spend a lot of time digging in. And the one I just sent off in Texas, I think I got 588 records yeah. to send off, which is right at the minimum from yep. rocket printed mail. You spend a lot of time digging in and working it out and pricing, and it's not a huge volume. You're not talking like thousands at a time, you're talking like hundreds at a time. Yep. Um, yeah. Any so this is what I, I increase that or make it more time 
So you got to think about it. Yeah, and I'll I'll provide context for the rest of the group. So what Donald's talking about here is if you are, there's like three main strategies that we talk about. If we're trying to simplify our market selection process, right? First off, we're going to go look for demand. Then we're going to go look for areas, which if we're using an offer strategy, which I think for most beginners is going to make the most sense, we have to have a way to go break down counties, right? If we call a market a county, well, how do we go break that down and find pockets that have uniform or homogenous pricing? There's like three things we typically look at, right? You guys hear us talk a lot about subdivisions. Most subdivisions are going to have pretty uniform pricing. You can use polygons. That could be like Donald's talking about to draw around a subdivision, or that could be to take a third of a county. And then there's the acreage filters. And so you go look at, you know, Creek County, Oklahoma. Well, you might find out 20 to 40 acres try to trade in a very tight range, right? And in some cases, you might stack all those filters together, right? They're the, they're, uh, they overlap. So the, the common thing that we hear with, especially with the subdivision stuff, or really all this stuff in general, is that you're typically pulling smaller data sets, namely when it comes to subdivisions. Now, if you start going into markets where the county is topographically homogenous across the board, more than likely you could pull acreage ranges that have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 records. But even if that's the case, right, we're pulling, we do mailers that have 60 records in them, and then we do mailers that have maybe on the high end 2,500, 3,000. At that point, it starts to get pretty tricky for us to, to understand pricing. Um, the way I look at it, though, is this is like an annuity, right? You crack the code once, you don't mail that thing once. You mail that thing for years to come. And so that work is not work once, get paid once. That is work once, get paid many, many, many times over again. And so the way I've reframed that, at least for me, is like it's it's valuable work. And again, if we look at the return from some of these smaller mailers, not to generalize and say smaller mailers are always going to be better, we have some mailers where it's you send out 70 mailers and you get a deal that that yields 100k net. I mean, it's still worth your time, right? And that that speaks to the level of accuracy that you can bring to the table. Um, so yeah, I think, but just from a, a bird's eye view, this is not something that you're going to you use once, right? And eventually, you know, if we look at our business today, probably 80% of the mailers we're doing are just remailing to markets that we already have a proof of concept in. And so we typically remail quarterly in most environments. Um, so yeah, no, these are small data sets. I mean, if you if you looked inside what sending out 20,000 mailers looks like for us, it's dozens or in some cases, 100 plus small little data sets. The other thing though, is that we have to understand is part of creating this binary or binary-ish kind of black and white process is not so you're the one in the seat doing it forever. Because if Donald can learn it, Donald can hire someone and they can learn it as well. And so that's more of the end game is eventually getting someone to run the system for you. Um, but yeah, no matter how you slice it, it's, it's, it's definitely time consuming and it can be a bit of a, a heartache process. Does that make sense? Yeah. No, it yeah. Does, yeah. Makes sense. yeah. So, yeah, I mean, again, I always tell people and sometimes on these calls, I've gone and pulled up my data tree and like 60 records, 12 records, 1200 records. And like, you know, a lot of these can be really small. It's just kind of the name of the game, at least for executing on this strategy, right? There's a lot of ways to skin the cat in this business. There's a lot of ways to get paid. But what we're really trying to optimize for is for how do we get a new land investor scaled up? Well, it's easier to do that proactive work on the front end, pricing markets and selecting markets, than it is you going and dropping 10,000 neutral letters and fielding a bunch of calls at random hours. And again, we also, if you are doing that game, we have to assume that you're really good at working leads and you're really good at pre-qualifying leads. Now, that's why when we take a story like Andy Barlow, he sent out 40,000 neutral letters before joining us and got no deals. The byproduct of one, he couldn't handle this, this tidal wave of leads. They also didn't have the chops to go through and, and, and pre-qualify those leads because there's a very small segment in that, that 40,000 mailers they sent people that are actually genuinely qualified, right? The other thing on top of those, once you start taking that strategy uh, of just being, I call it sloppy, but some people just call it scaling their marketing and grabbing a state and just throwing neutral letters at it. When you get deals back, you are starting your due diligence process for the first time over again. Like you're doing it for the first time. When you go pull that market, let's say it's a subdivision of 500 records. Well, in the process of pricing it, you're going to be able to know if it's a deal or not within 10 minutes when it comes in down to you. And so that I think it, that saves a ton on the back end. Um, but though I always tell people either the work happens on the front end or it happens on the back end. It just happens to be for most new land investors, that front end work is way more sustainable. So my two cents on that one. Uh, but again, not to say you couldn't make money other other ways. We've just found this is the path of least resistance. Uh, Jay, you got a question in conjunction with that? No, it's, no. Uh, it's a completely different set of questions. Okay. I, I was just, just raising my hand to keep you going. <laughs> okay. You're good, man. What, what's, what's the, what are the questions? Unless Donald, is it, do you, have, you feel clear on that? 
No, yeah, we're we're good. Okay, okay cool. I, I I feel good. Thanks for that. Yeah, cool. Uh, all right, Jay, what do, what do you got for me? All right, so what what makes a county a good county for you? Hmm. Well, what do we qualify good as in this case? I mean, that's definitely going to be subjective. I'll tell you what my view of good is, and we can kind of work off of that. So when we were talking about going and finding markets, I imagine like one of those like law scales that they have that we're trying to balance, right? And so we're trying to balance, yes, there is demand for land. People actually want to buy land. And then hopefully there's not just demand for land. There's also not this oversupply of land. Take Florida, right? Demand is super strong. I mean, you'll see you know, 500 properties selling a month or 200 properties selling a month at a 20 or 30% sell through rate. But there's also 6,000 pieces of inventory. And so again, you just start getting shuffled to the bottom. So demand, but hopefully in conjunction, there's not too much supply. And the flip side of that is ideally homogenous pricing. Now, what do I think ties into homogenous pricing? I would say topographical features. So mountains, lakes, rivers, oceans, I call cities topographical features, that's going to swing price typically, not always, but to generalize, right? Um, there are some markets where it's like flat and it looks exactly the same, but for whatever reason, one area is a little more desirable than the other. Maybe there's big oil boom up there. There's stuff that you can't see topographically, but for the most part, that's going to be the driving factor. So like we've been talking a lot about Oklahoma lately. I'm not quite sure why that's been so popular, but go pull up almost any county in Oklahoma. And it, it literally visually on the map, you can see it's exactly the same. Like it really does not change much. And so that's really helpful. I think climate can also dictate uh, differences in price, right? Um, so yeah, the best case is there's tons of demand. Topographically, it should be relatively similar, but that's going to more feed into just some kind of consistency in pricing. And so my favorite type of mailer, it doesn't always happen. My favorite type of mailer is when I walk into a county that's just like screaming at me that there's demand. And then I go and look and I say, holy shit, the 10 to 20 acres trade between 5,000 and 6,000 an acre. And the 20s to 40s trade at 5,000 to 5,200 an acre across the whole county. And now that is usually, oh, the county is totally the same across the board. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And, and I, I realized, like, I think that was good information, but I worded my question poor. So I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm, 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 Should I'm have stopped me, this. man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try this again. I, I meant in terms of, okay, uh, you're, you're mailing a county or you're mailing a, a, a segment of the county. Um, is is one deal per 5,000 pieces of mail oh, what yeah. you're looking for like why why would you go and double down on a county yeah and then I've got a follow-up question to that question when you're done with that okay I'll answer this one first we do the follow-up <laughs> so yeah the best data I can ever get is ideally from actually going full cycle on a deal that's going to tell me more than anything but even if I ha don't have that I can still learn from the number of leads I got uh and the, the kind of quality of leads I got but my the best case scenario I've cited this example before but I'll go through it again I actually told you this example, Jay, but it might be worthwhile for the others in the group. There's a market in Southern Colorado, uh, kind of adjacent east of Costilla County, for some, those that know where that is. I thought this market looked pretty good. as a little subdivision that was roaming through the hills. I went and mailed it. I'd mailed a super small set. I mailed like 700 letters. My pricing was off. I got like crickets. And so from that, I was like, all right, I think I fucked up pricing. I hadn't given up on the market yet. So I go back there. I re go back to the drawing board fix my pricing, send it out. And we got like three deals from those 700 letters. And those three deals all sold in less than four weeks. They all sold somewhere between like 100% to 120% uh, return. I mean, like each deal was like a buy for 30, sell for 60, 70, something like that. So for me, I was like, well, ding, 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 sell through rates crazy. I've cracked the code on pricing because I know my first mailer was not it. My second one was it. And there's huge margins here. And so the, for me, that's like a clear winner. Now, not in every case are you going to have the luxury of doing a deal, right? I still had to have enough confirmation that I thought this was a good market to go remail it again after my first failed attempt. Um, so, I mean, again, like, there's two, two ways to break it down. There's what happens once you get to the deal. That's pretty obvious. What was the clip on that deal? How quick did it turn around? And you can make decisions from there. Now, let's say you do a mailer and you don't do a deal yet, but you're trying to decipher what's happening with those leads, right? So, I mean, I think like a decent, a decent metric to, to hold would be for a lead flow. So if I send a thousand letters, I would like to see, I think five leads is pretty healthy, right? So not 10,000, you get about 50, somewhere in there, plus or minus, it's going to change from market to market. And then I want to figure out what those leads are telling me, right? So we did a mailer in Texas, like three months ago, a subdivided mailer. Every single call was a screaming fuck you. I mean, it's like people were at a fever pitch. 
And so I, I had to go back and we were way off on price. And so you'll usually learn more about the pricing from that than anything. Um, so on the front end, we're taking a bit of a gamble in terms of trying to th see like, hey, do the sell through rate validate what we're thinking here? Then we'll go pull data based on the lead flow that we're going to get. We'll make a decision on remailing and repricing. And then really like the confirmation to double down and redo a market is usually going to come from what happens when we go do a deal there. Um, does that make sense to everyone? Because there's kind of two steps to that, right? There's what happens when a deal gets done. There's what happens when the leads start coming in. But frankly, I think you have to have conviction in the process, right? So if you've done your homework on the front end and you go do a mailer and you get crickets, I think that's more uh, invalidating your pricing than invalidating your market selection, right? I think a lot of people get the two confused and they say, ah, on to the next. When it'd be better to go back to the drawing board, in my opinion. Now, we've got to be careful of sample sizes though, right? Very easy to have a small sample size and get lucky and then think you've hit gold and that's not the case, right? And so those those can sway your results a little bit. Um, all right, and in, in order here. Oh, you had another question, Jay, didn't you? Yeah, you, you touched on some of it. I think it's, uh, I've got to iterate. So I uh, I sent neutral letters to a, to a segment of a county back in February, got one deal out of that, circled back, sent blind offers at what I thought was 45% of retail yep. and got, and got zero response. Yep. So, so what happened when you sent the neutral letters? Uh, I, I got a deal out of it. Got I think I got, yeah, like two or three, two or three calls out of a yeah. 2,500 mail piece um, campaign. Yeah. 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 So I think that's a reflection of the fact that, and I, I have this happen all the time or often enough to say all the time, we think we know pricing. The Texas example is a great example of that. I thought I knew pricing and I went out there and was offering for subdivided candidates at like 6,000, 7,000 an acre. And I was so off. I mean, like so off. It's just because I was looking at limited data. Let's say I have 20 comps. Well, that's not a fair reflection of value, right? And maybe I also didn't do my homework on the swing in price for that county as well because we were mailing the whole county in that case. So again, you've already validated this is a good market. So now we just got to crack the code on pricing. So it's actually a really nice example because that first thing has told you everything you need to know. Although three calls on a neutral letter to 2,500 campaigns, it must be a really competitive market because that's that's pretty low for, for neutral letters. It's a, uh, well, I mean, yeah, I, I could look at the data. Maybe I was maybe I was off with, with the response, but anyway. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was like a 0.25%. A <laughs> that's low for neutral yeah. for sure man <laughs> that's probably just smoking hot county i yeah. did that deal sell fast when you got it one day on the market yeah well dude come on what do you expect yeah yeah that i mean like there is such a thing uh, where i mean it's not too hot of a market but there is such a thing where a market is so gosh darn hot hot you've really got to reframe your expectations of what's going to go down there right like you know we've been working outside of austin for text and and mail, oh my God, whole different can of worms of how much effort it takes to get a single call back or to even get a decent lead. And so that, that also might be something of reframing your expectations. And that neutral letter kind of tells us that. But the, the question is, well, is sending out 10,000 letters to get a deal hypothetically in that market worth selling it in a day? And is the ROAS still strong? Probably, right? You just have to be a little more fearless in your marketing efforts to say, I'm cool. This is exactly what we've gone through with the subdivide stuff. I had to go and wait eight months and shell out tens of thousands of dollars in marketing with nothing in return and just to say, I think I know this works. I know this works, but that's just the name of the game. And in fact, I think the ROAS is actually better from those efforts, but you've got to outpour a lot of capital and you've got to be really patient. And so that's just kind of a decision that you have to make as the owner. But if you want better, like faster turnaround or faster yield from your mailers or less marketing dollars that have to go out to get a lead, stuff that's a little more in the, the middle in terms of, you know, too hot, too cold for a market might be better suited. One day for land is, I mean, it's bonkers. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I got one more, one more question for you yeah. here and I'll turn it over to the other guys. Um, how do you, when, when you're working, maybe it just doesn't apply to you anymore, but to, to those of us in the group that are using the, uh, the, the funding guys to do this stuff, and you've got to come with, with two broker prices. Well, going back to the same county, I'm going to go back to the guy that sold sold my land for yeah. me as fast as possible. And I trust him and he's in the game. He's selling land himself. 
but I've got to go find this other, you know, find some other broker to give me a BPO that I'm never going to use. And now that I've burned through them, I can't talk to them. Right, right. So, so how do you, so, so when, when having to find multiple BPOs, how do you, do you stop burning these guys yeah. out or burning? Yeah, man. So in the context of deal funding, I mean, I, again, I don't want to teach anyone to be a super rebel here, but we push back. I mean, two, come on, two, that's ridiculous. If they trust you and maybe for your first deal with them, sure. But as they trust you as a land investor, a zero or one should be good enough, right? So I think that is a trust thing in the relationship. That's like a, uh, like a barrier to entry that they want to kind of weed out the tire kickers. But as you build that relationship, frankly, we've never even sent them a, a, a BPO for any deal. Um, so I think that changes over time because that's, that's an absurd expectation to maintain. Now, more from a general standpoint, how do we get BPOs from realtors? You're right. You, you, you burn through people. You talk to a lot of people. You piss people off. Well, I mean, in, in a lot of cases, like I've paid for BPOs in a few times and it's never worth it. It's never worth it. A lot of cases, just tell us exactly what we already know. Um, so yeah, I mean, in that example, I would use the realtor you've already worked with. I think one realtor that you trust is worth 10 realtors that you don't know. And I would just I would just counter them on that. And again, when it comes to this deal funding stuff, what I've seen is it's very much a two-way street. You can counter, you can make a case. If they deny a deal, you can make a case and rebuttal them. It's never they know better. And in fact, I think they respect when people kind of defend their stance. I think that's how you can build a deeper relationship with them. Because it very much is a kind of a relationship arrangement. Um, so yeah, I don't have a clear answer on the BPO stuff. What I will say is, we so we use Zoom to go find the the uh, realtors that are selling the most land in that area. Reach out to them if they're worth their salt. They're usually willing to do it. It's just we get some people that think it's a money making opportunity, and for me, that's typically a I'm I'm not even going to work with you. And I've played, I've fallen into that trap a few times, and it's not worth it. Um, and then once you start working in markets, and again, there's so much value, kind of to what we we're talking about with Donald. There is so much value in re reusing your, your data and remarketing the areas, but even beyond that, getting vertically integrated, right? Having your title companies, having a realtor and not having to go play that game of trying to fetch new ones every time is worth a lot. Uh, and I, I mean, it's actually worth more than I ever expected. So much so that we're starting to rethink a lot of our efforts of like, why don't we just double down even deeper on these places? Because it is really difficult, especially once we start talking about, you know, using banks for funding subdivides or finding title companies for double closes just makes infinitely more sense to consolidate in one area. Um, so yeah, my best advice there is push back. <laughs> okay. My best advice to you. Um, cool. And make sure that if you're pushing back, make sure you've done your homework. Because in a lot of cases, that realtor is going to show them exactly what you found because you're, you're, you're probably trained better than a realtor at comping properties at this point. Um, all right, Mr. McLeod, what you got? Hey, what's up, Sumner? So I wanted to ask you about the folks that called you back from Texas that told you to go screw yourself. How did yeah. you find, A, how did you find out about that? Do you check in with Pat Live with every phone call that you get? And then B, did you remarket to them with a better price afterwards? And yeah. what did you use to come up with better pricing if your initial sources weren't accurate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So first off, um, I don't go through every single Pat Live call that comes in. It would be it would be pretty tricky. But every single Pat Live, the notes get imp imported into the the follow up boss of the CRM record. So my every one of my team sees that. My team will relay it to me, like, "Hey, Sumner, you sent out two thousand letters here. Literally every lead on this is pissed off." But that's important information to kind of get run up through the the chain of commands. And I will go through and like I've listened to a few calls from Pat Live. But it's not something I make a habit of. Um, and so you'll see that in like the, the comment section, we ask them a question at the end, like any additional remarks or something like that. And they'll, they'll usually scream at you about how this is too low and never co contact me again, kind of stuff. And typically those aren't even leads. I mean, our, our, our protocol is to call every person. Those are typically leads you're never going to turn around. They just want to call someone and, and scream at them. And so if my team does get a hold of them, which is rare, they'll usually relay the same <laughs> offensive language to my team. Um, no, I didn't realize Pat Live did a transcript of all the calls like that. That's pretty cool. Well, yeah. So you can get a, you can listen to a recording, but what they do is they go through. And so you've got your questions, right? You go through the question, they go through the questions and you'll start to hear their crazy tone in there. And then that other remarks or other comment section is usually where they really let it rip. Um, and then if like something happens on the call, so like we'll still, if a, if a seller hangs up halfway through the call, they'll still send us that information and Pat Live will say, Hey, 
seller was mad. They hung up halfway to the call. So they'll give like a little interpretation. I don't know if you can get transcripts. You very well might be able to, but I know you can get the recording, but the notes is what we're, what we're really using. Um, in terms of the pricing side of things, yes, that the, no, no perfect answer here. I mean, sometimes going through and coming back again with the, Hey, I thought I was at 5,000 micro, let's say hypothetically, and I come back and look at the data. Sometimes I will see new things. Sometimes I won't see new things. And if I don't see new things, well, obviously the sources of data that I have are giving me a misrepresentation of what's happening. And so then I got to go play the game of having someone call realtors. And so they're usually like finding one good realtor. Like we found this guy, James, who works outside of San Antonio. It's like every county that's adjacent to San Antonio, he can tell me exactly what the price breaker is. And so that guy becomes like my, my bird dog way more so than what I can find on Redfin. But in some cases, like I thought it was 5,000 an acre. I go back and look at the data. I'm like, what was I thinking? I was like so off. You still make mistakes. Um, but more, I think more than not, more than not, it's a it's a misrepresentation of price based on too little of a data set. And then you've got to go and start calling realtors. That's the only way I know how to do it. Now, I mean, you could just try to take a very unscientific approach. And what some people do is like they go and let's say you go download your data from data tree. They'll go through and say, okay, I think all properties are worth 6,000 an acre, right? And it's crazy that you can do this and it's still profitable. So they think everything's 6,000 an acre. So that inside their, their data set, they'll go make new columns. So it's like 35%, 45%, 55%, 65%. And they will just ch- they mail those out in a cadence spaced out and see which one hits. That's expensive, <laughs> but it's a way to learn. Uh, I, I've never done that at scale, but we have, I mean, we obviously tag everything. And so you could just say, hey, I did 50%. Maybe I'll bump up, but you're not really diagnosing the underlying issue of not knowing what values are. You're just skewing your offer percentage. Awesome. Thanks, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, Mr. Owens, Mr. Ari Owens. And Ari, while you're on the, the mic, I'd love an update yeah. on the subdivide deal. But first, let's, let's take it away with your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so just for context, I'm out coming back from the grocery store. So if you hear my child yelling, that's that's what that is. Mm-hmm. Um, so actually, uh, going back to Jay's initial question about knowing whether or not a county is hot or good, um, I'm actually curious because you just said that, you know, if you find the right realtor, they're able to tell you exactly the price per acreage. And if you're working on an acreage filter, that's pretty valuable. So I'm curious, wh- why not just do even more due diligence up front and, you know, go look at a county that's hot, go find a real, like just go shopping for realtors before. Is that too much effort? Would you really prefer to send out maybe 100, 200 mailers to figure out if people are going to say F you? Or would you just, would you just prefer to talk to some realtors and get some hot zip codes versus, you know yeah. what I mean? No, I know what you mean. I, there, there's actually a, a handful of folks that I know that that's kind of their process, right? Okay. Like, hey, let's go deem if the market's actually got people that want to buy land. But really, their litmus test for should I work here is can I get, again, vertically integrated? Can I find a great realtor? Can they list my properties? Can they tell me where to buy, whether it's zip codes or parts of the county? And then can they tell me pricing for that area? If they can't, they'll move on, right? Because it's such a, a benefit sure. to their business. So it's not something that we do, but it's yeah, something you certainly could do. Um, and again, like if you're coming at this from the long-term frame of working these markets, no harm, no foul, right? Like, I mean, you, it's worth doing that work on that front end because that yeah. one market, you know, I know people that make half a million dollars a year from one county. Like, I know people that work just one county or people that work a handful of counties and they make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year from that one county. They've been doing it for years. So again, it's like these things can become almost like annuities for you. And so that extra work can certainly be worth it. And I think frankly, all right, your head's in the right place. I mean, we're, yeah. again, it's not something that we're doing currently. But I like the view. I think it's a lot more, it's a little more of a long-term view, right? Where a lot of people are on this vicious hamster wheel of mailing, new county, new county, new county, new county. Sure. Instead of kind of building some roots and getting deep in some place, that means going and finding support. The the counter to that though is, Ari, have you tried to go find good realtors? Uh, is this a process you've gone through? I, I haven't gone through doing it before I mail. No. Yeah. So I, so I do usually do it like you said, because I'm using uh, the Polygon tool. So I'm I'm having to do due diligence every single time I get a lead, which does take up a lot of time, especially with the W-2. So I get yeah. it. One thing that you might have already found or you will find is that finding a good realtor is not easy. <laughs> really, definitely not easy. Um, so it's not, it's not always an option or it's not always known 
which which is a good realtor and sometimes you're not going to call every realtor and so you can miss them the best thing you guys can do for realtors is referrals ask people in the group that is a surefire way to get curated information that's going to be relevant way more relevant than going through zoom and trying to call everyone i would suggest just lean on the group that's how we found a lot of our best realtors is just through that um, one of the other things that we've done for like a value add subdivide stuff is we go and look at subdivide value add deals that sold recently and say, who is a realtor on that and get a hold of these people. And they've yeah, been sure. huge assets to our business. I mean, those guys, a lot of times what they'll do is like they'll borderline partner with the land investor. And so they'll have all the resources. They'll show you the guy to cut the road. They got the lady in the county that can get you, you know expedited through that process. And so they might have a little more upside in the deal or just a higher uh, agent commission on it. Um, but those guys, what I've noticed is they know markets like the back of their hand because they're underwriting bigger deals. And so even if you're not doing a subdivide or a value add deal, those are great realtors to know. And those are usually land specific realtors. You're pretty yeah. much never going to find a house realtor that snags a value add subdivide listing. It's just like unheard of, I would think. Um, so it's kind of a, an interesting little hack to find better realtors. Thank you. Yeah, that's yeah. Thanks for that. No, that's actually a really good segue too into the update. But um, I, I agree with you completely. I I've been focusing mostly on realtors that I see. Um, you you did this on one of your other um, calls, but where you see like land group or land bros or you know like a focus on land. And uh, regarding the update, it's actually funny because I called up the realtor I saw who sold I think three properties down the road over a course of six months and she was part of like the midwest land group which i was like perfect this is it um i i didn't want to just stop there so i start i started looking around even further for more comps and, and realtors working there and everybody was a part of that same group so i felt okay i'm gonna call this this woman up call her up and she's just like pretty astounded that i'm able to that i'm potentially acquiring 80 acres in the part of creek county that i am she actually grew up um <laughs> it's funny uh, how things work out but she grew up in Bristow which is a city just below and she oh. actually uh, her parents live on the the home right behind this property so she's extraordinarily familiar with the the land itself and um, yeah she was able to quote me actually um, at uh, for five acres up to 15,000 per uh, per acre which is pretty Wait, great 15,000 an acre yeah she said if I can get it down to five each uh, they would pretty much it would pretty much uh, for, for context, everyone in this group, this is a for buying for 4,300 an acre, 80 acres. Uh, it's a deal that uh, looks like Ari and I are going to partner on a subdivide in Oklahoma. 15,000 an acre seems really high. Yeah, she she has sold a couple others at 10 to 12 uh, yeah. an, an acre. So, um, but I'm inclined to believe her because um, she sold probably four or five of the, the closest in proximity comps. Um, yeah. I'll have, to, I'll have to do some more due diligence, but she was a uh, she's pretty ecstatic about about the actual land we were working with. It's so um, weird. Her parents live behind the property. Yeah, literally <laughs> the parcel, the parcel right behind the land. Like wow, too weird. Yeah. So yeah. So um, on top of that, uh, the other thing is, I got an email from uh, one of the sisters. The the three parcels all, that all uh, add up to eighty acres total for everyone else. Um, they're they're three different sisters. I couldn't hear the first sister when she called in, and so she gave me her sister's number, called her sister, and then I got immediately kind of built some rapport with her and got her under contract. Uh, um, and you know, through God's good grace, I was able to speak with uh, the second sister, which I had not yet met, and she and I built great rapport as well. And I think she's like totally cool with everything um now she spoke to the third sister who was the most hesitant and basically they're all on board now so oh. now uh, i called her today and missed her and then she actually butt dialed me and then we got on the phone uh, for five minutes before we both just said hey you know there's no rush um i think we know what's going to happen and we'll just we'll just talk on monday before uh you know before too long goes by so yeah. so yeah i mean i feel like rapport has been built and uh, we're pretty much on the way to to signing contracts. Wow, man, that's so that is exciting. So walk the group through. Let's assume that uh, all eighty acres get purchased. Three sisters on these lots. Three separate purchase agreements. Walk us through the preliminary numbers. We'll kind of underwrite it at ten k an acre and then fifteen k an acre. But what are we looking like in terms of acquisition price on this? Yeah, absolutely. And 
you'll have to forgive me since I'm out. I don't have everything in front of me, but, yeah. um, but yeah, 43, about a 43 an acre. So I'm actually buying 25 acres at one, uh, 12, um, yeah. buying another 25 acres at one, uh, 16. I mean, they've, they've all been appraised for, uh, those two 25s have been appraised for, um, one eighteen. So just under what I've offered and, and they've received probably 50 or 60 offers. And they told me in the past month alone, they feel like they've been bombarded with, with offers. And it's everyone the, in the Leah group, man. Everyone's from the Leah's damn county. <laughs> Everybody's talked to Mildred too, uh, which oh, is another yeah. owner out there. So that's kind of funny. Um, yeah. but yeah, so buying those two, uh, around that price point and then buying the middle one, which is 30 acres at, um, 127. And so it, it kind of feels like a, a scary all in just because I'm almost paying market value for all three, but it, you know, it, it's, well, it's well, really the value at market value. You're paying like a praise value. That's not yeah. Value. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And, and it was honestly um, probably a praise a little low in my opinion. Yeah. yeah so, I don't think there's anything on the market listed even close to those. Yeah, that's very true. Um, and so, all all together all in um it's going to be probably 355 before yeah. closing costs before um any other you know costs that go into it and then coming out i mean it, it really is um it's a big play and it just determines it, it just uh it's completely contingent on how we want to split up a parcel and how difficult that subdivide process is I, i've looked into it so much at this point and spoken i'm on like first name basis with uh both women at the county office or the county planning office. Yeah. And um, it, it's, it's just, I can't, I can't learn enough about it, even though they do it. They say they do it like every week or, or every few weeks. It's like, I still feel like I'm going to need to know everything in and out, but you know, I'm, I'm an over planner and I tend to get stuck in analysis. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think the potential here is at the very least, um, leaving with 600. So it's not quite a double at the very least, yeah. uh, but at the very most, I mean, you're looking at um, like 850, um, maybe even a little higher potentially. Yeah, 1.2 1. if it's at 15, but that, again, that seems unlikely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's, it's, it's a good pretty deal. big play. <laughs> it's a good deal, man. Good first deal as well. <laughs> or well, you've already <laughs> done a deal, but first, you know, cash close kind of deal. Let's say first Leah deal. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's awesome, man. Kudos. Well, yeah, well, I, I know you sent me a message. I'll, I'll check that uh, later. Any additional questions you want to go through? Um, no, it was mostly just uh, the hot market. I, I think I've got to focus on um, who I work with in terms of realtors, because like Jay okay. said, he'll pick someone out. And yeah, I've, I've been doing that. I had someone else in mind, actually, in Creek County. Yep. But you can really get some big red flags from just a few conversations. And I feel like I owe it to them. They've given me so much, but then at the same time, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to trust you with my deal. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. I think I have a decent realtor out there too. We might be able to use. Well, cool, man. I'll, I'll check those messages after and we'll, we'll get the ball rolling on it. Um, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I believe it's Tukir, but you could correct me if I'm wrong. I know your yeah. hand's been up for a while. It's Takir. You got, you got Takir. it. Takir. Cool. Awesome. It's a cool name. I like, I'm a, as you can tell, I'm a fan of unique names with a name like Sumner. I appreciate that. Sumner. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I, I, I was going to say, I'm, I'm that guy basically who you were kind of talking about earlier. Um, I got into land flipping uh, a few months ago. Um, I only heard about you last week for the very first time. Um, uh, basically through Jesse Kwong's uh, interview that yeah. you had on Pebble. Yeah. Um, but I, I made that mistake where I sent out range offers and I, I should have sent out blind offers in the beginning. Um, but anyway, I just, I wanted to kind of throw that out there, but I have, um, I have two questions for you. One is kind of general, uh, and for the group, and then one is kind of more specific to my situation, but obviously I'm sure it can benefit everyone. Yeah. Uh, the first question is you're talking about, um, you know, remailing counties over and over again. Um, is there ever a point where, you feel like you know county gets overfished and like you just you, you stop mailing that county or do you like is this your county forever or <laughs> yeah dude i i i you know it's funny like my own limiting beliefs get in the way and i start to think god the party's over like it's got to be done and i've yet to be proven wrong we have had markets that have become oversaturated not because of us though at least i don't think but like 
Okay, there's just, and usually, you know, what's funny where I've seen the real saturation is on the disposition side. Not that we can't still go get yield from our mailers, but I got to go compete with, you know, 200 plus other listings. When back in the day, there was 30 or 40. A good example of that is Ash Fork, Arizona. It used to be a great market for me, right? Go buy 40s out there. go buy it for 20, sell for 40, 45 all day long. You'd sell it in like less than four weeks, typically. Um, funnily enough, Michael Bull's first deal was a buy for 20, sell for 40 out there. Ryland's first deal was a buy for 20, sell for 45 out there. And then now if you go look at Ash Fork, it's just like, there's just so much supply. But I can still mail it, so still get a deal or, or with a high level of certainty. Um, one thing that I do do for the remailing is, so we typically replenish our data, typically annually. So I'm not going to rock 2019 data for remailing in 2023. Um, especially if the market's really hot, we might do it even a little bit sooner. If there's a lot of turn, a lot of properties turning over, I just have all the wrong names and wrong addresses. So it's like, it's really no good. Um, but yeah, dude, I, you know, I always tell people uh, it's usually the best, the best judgment call is going to be based off of what the cold, hard facts are telling you, AKA the data, AKA the yield from the mailing less. So your stance on when you think a market goes sour. And so I've gotten in the way of being like, oh, it has to be done. And it's usually not done. And so I would just let the numbers tell you whether that's yield from your mailing. So you went and mailed twice and you know, so you mailed it previously, but the last two times it was crickets or it's just a bunch of no's or the pricing was off. Well, you might need to adjust your pricing when the party might be over or alternatively we go and this is usually more the tell for us is we'll go and look online and there's just a lot of stuff with big days on the market or a lot of supply. And so usually it might be a bit of a, more of a demand issue or there's just too much supply that's changed things. But I've always been surprised. See you, Dan. Thanks for joining us, man. I've always been surprised at how these markets can withstand a lot of participants on the acquisition side. And I think that's a, partially a byproduct of, you know, a lot of what we do is really kind of time-based marketing. And so Ben could go mail someone tomorrow and I could go send that mail to them uh, the next day. And maybe I get through to them and Ben does it and they pick me simply as a byproduct because Ben's letter never got opened, right? So I think a lot of markets can handle a lot more. They're way sturdier on the acquisition side than they are on the disposition side. That's a lot more sensitive because in any given market, there's only X amount of real buyers out there at any given moment. And so there's some markets that just literally can't support how much supply there is. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. My my other question um, is basically so I'm I've got a, a lead right now where I've got a three acre property that's commercially zoned uh, in Ohio, um, and basically what's going on with this property is the the property owner he bought it uh, back in two thousand six for eight eighty thousand, um, he's willing to give it to me for a little less than forty thousand, um, but what what's going on with it is got it's got this this creek that runs from like the Southwest corner to the Northeast corner. So basically just divides the land in half. Um, it's not, it's not one of those creeks that's like constantly running. It's, it's a creek that's like, um, sorry, if you, if you, if you hear my kids in the background, but, no, you're good. Um, um, but yeah, basically this creek is, it's like, it's only one of those creeks that just fills up kind of a little bit after, after the rain. Um, but anyway, I've been talking to the Ohio EPA and also the uh, Army Corps of uh, Civil Engineers, basically, and just to see, like, kind of like what what is the possibility of building over that creek? Um, I, like, they're very slow to respond. So, like, I'm still I'm still in the process of talking to them, but it seems like it's it's actually very easy. It, it's going to be a very easy process um, to basically just build over it. Um, my question for you, I guess, more so is because I I I got. Um, uh, an opinion of value on it uh, from a couple of realtors. And one of them is actually, um, he, he's a commercial real estate agent. Um, so he told me like kind of on the higher end, he said 150,000 on the lower end, 90,000. Okay. Um, but, um, you know, he, he obviously, he, he himself also has concerns with this creek that runs through it. He said, you know, if, if that creek uh, basically affects the buildability of the land, you know, it really affects, you know, like you can only build on half of it, right? Because it just divides it in half. But Again, I don't think that is going to be an issue, but um, really, my 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 concern, I guess, is the the owner. He did try to list it a couple of times. Um, mm -hmm. I think in 2014, and uh, this is just based on some research that I did. I just saw the history on, on Realtor.com. Um, but he tried listing in 2013 and 2014, uh, didn't sell. He tried listing get listing listing it again in 2019, didn't sell. And so I'm just wondering, you know, like, is there something that I'm missing here yeah. that 
you know, like it, it's kind of making me a little bit fearful to, to go forward. It seems like a great, a great deal, especially if, you know, the creek isn't that big of a deal or an issue. But, you know, like the fact that he tried listing it twice and he wasn't able to sell it twice, that's kind of making me hesitant. Yeah, dude, really timely question. Uh, and I'll try to give you my best answer on it. So before I do, let me give a little context. So on our on our uh, Leah call on Monday, we went through this deal that I'm working on that's pretty much identical. It's a commercial lot. It's in Washington. It's got a creek running north to south. It's actually three adjacent commercial lots. This creek is very small, though, and it's only on like the front part of the property. There's like a small, very small little bridge that goes across it. Um, yeah, one, actually, one question before I dive into the story. Do you know, is, is this in like a true like flood zone or does it have wetlands on it? Like, is the creek affecting the rest of the property? Based on what I saw um, on MapRite, it, yeah. it it doesn't have any any other wetlands. But then the guy who I'm talking to from the Army Corps of Civil Engineers, he says that it has ha like what's called hydric soils, which means that there's po the possibility of wetlands on it. Yeah. Um, and so he he told me like, oh, they have to go out there, they have to do a delineation on the creek itself, they have to do a deline delineation on the entire property and. He said, you know, if there's like, if there's actually hydric soils, soils on there, then it's going to be like a very lengthy and uh, process and you know, have to apply for the permits and everything. And so he was kind of scaring me a little bit, but like kind of just based on, you know, the way it looks. And the, the other thing is also because like across the street is like there's a high school next to it. There's other office buildings. So, you know, really like that creek is only on this land, like everybody else around built over the creek. Right. It like. Right. So. So, yeah, that's. This is tricky, man. So uh, I'll finish my story and then I'll kind of tell you my thoughts around this. So the, the going back to the context of this deal, very similar. Um, the difference is the upside, right? So you don't really have much of a buffer for getting this wrong. So this deal that we're buying, it's 13 acres, buying it at 200K. There's, funnily enough, there's three, there's, there's three comps, two that have sold, one of them is on market, so a listed comp, that are pr perfect proof of concepts. So we've got a 16 acre, less than like uh, probably 500 yards from this property, just a little bit north. That's 16 acres that sold at 3.5 million, like a couple months ago, or it's actually under contract right now, 3.5 million. And this suffers from the same wetlands kind of issue. It has the same little, at one time, the same little creek kind of running through it. Um, there's a, a, a another four acre lot that's like, I don't know, 200 yards southwest of ours. That just sold to commercial lot. It's four acres. It sold at three fifty, and then there's a four acre commercial lot that's listed at one point two right now. That doesn't have any wetlands on it. So as you can see from this, like we've got a big margin of error here, right? The thing with the three point five million dollar deal is they went and actually filled the soil, and so that's how that was their workaround. Someone's going to go build two hundred fifty apartment units on it. They spent one point five million dollars tackling that problem, and. I think it took a couple of years to sell. I can't remember the exact time frame. So they had to, you know, buy the deal and then sink the cost of 1.5 mil and had to have that sit for a while. But there's still enough margin in it to, to make it okay. The risk with this deal here is that, okay, our best case is 150, which is good, but let's just call it, you know, 150 is probably gonna take a long time. Let's just say we're probably more realistically gonna sell at 100. Well, we've got two different things that happen. One, that doesn't happen and we got to sell it way lower than that. Or two, there is a path to sell it at 100, but we have to go through soil scientists and all this rigmarole, which adds time and adds cost to the deal. So like when I'm looking at this $200,000 deal, I'm saying, if I have to fire sale this, I know tomorrow I could probably go get 350 or 400 for it. Or maybe it's a million dollar deal, but we have to go through all that rigmarole. So my concern is there's really just not enough margin to protect you. It's going to be really hard to get all those unknowns answered in a timely fashion to get the deal closed. You're going to probably have to do the deal with some risk in it. And I don't think I like that deal um, with that much risk. Now, here's the kicker. And I'm even thinking about doing this on this Washington commercial lot is your best bet would be to take this down with like an option contract, right? And what's cool about that is that, you know, we're all about, we've been talking a lot about double closes inside the group. But when we're looking at like commercial properties, this is very much the norm. And so for you to go lock it up on an option contract with, you know, a thousand or $2,000 option fee that might give you six months or a year, you're framing that to the seller is this is for due diligence, which is true, but you can also go and market that property in the interim. And so I would rather see you out a thousand dollars if the deal goes sideways than 40. Right. And I think frankly, if you're new to the land business, you, you're probably going to use deal funders on that. I could be wrong, 
I think a lot of deal funders would have trepidation too. There's just a little too many unknowns for the limited upside. Now, this was a buy for 400 or for 40, and we thought we could go fetch 300 to 350 for it. People might take a swing at that because if we think about it statistically, like venture capital bets, well, you go make that bet 10 times and it plays out 20% of the time, or yeah, 20% of the time, well, it more than makes up for the other eight errors, right? But right now with the buy for 40, sell for 100, let's just say hypothetically, it probably doesn't play play out. The other thing is I'm definitely not a commercial lot expert, even in the slightest, but what I have seen in the commercial lot game is, dude, these things take so long to sell. Because think about it, there is a very finite audience for, for buyers for that thing. And so I think really, even if none of that stuff was, was an issue with the, the creek, I might still be more apt to go take that down with an option contract because I can go shop a buyer. And if I don't find one, then the no go. Ben gives us a thumb up. Ben's is our, ben is our resident commercial guy. And Ben will probably have, and he might even have some feedback on this deal for you as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, man, that's my two cents. Frankly, if the seller um, if the seller owns a commercial lot, they might be okay with that. They might understand, especially given the fact that it has the creek on it. Now, when we talk about the fact that he's listed it before, before I answer that part, do we know what he's listed it uh, at previously, price-wise? Yeah, so he tried uh, selling it for 90000 I think, yeah. the first time. And then I think the second time, it was about seventy. dollars mm, That's concerning. Have you addressed that with him? I haven't talked to him about that, no. Okay. So yeah, I would, I would address that with him and see what he says. I think, it, I think it would be interesting just to, to hear his rationale and maybe it's, maybe it was personal and some life event happened and yeah, that's why I had to take it down. Probably not the case, right? Be curious to hear what he says. I would also use that as a negotiation point. Was $40,000 the initial price that was uh, shown to him? Like, have you negotiated the deal at all? Um, I, I told him about uh, 35 and he really wanted more than that. Um, so he basically kind of came up to about 38, 30. Okay. Yeah. I think you could probably work him down a little bit if you had to, but yeah, what I would really encourage you to do is go the option contract route. I think that's going to be the safest bet. Um, you know, these are like commercial deals that we're looking at in Washington. These, even these, the ones that were priced relatively fairly still took years to sell. Yeah, and sure. so uh, it can be a tricky situation to find yourself. And I think you, if you want to have similar turn times, that are familiar to us in the land business for other asset classes, you've got to be able to price that thing at a pretty smoking hot deal. That's assuming it doesn't have hair on it. I know a guy um, who really his whole business is doing this though. He goes and finds commercial lots, like big, you know, 40 acre lots in Texas that are like adjacent to like a Costco or something goes oh. and locks them up on an option contract, either just goes and assigns it or, or double closes with a new buyer. And so he'll go shop his network of, you know, Chuck E. Cheese's and Target's and whatever, and try to get them to buy the deal. Or he'll lock it up on an option contract and go and title that deal and add value through entitlements. And so he might take a lot that he's buying at 500, he entitles it, rezones it, and sells it for 2 million to a, an end user. I think that's more of a common strategy with commercial stuff. But again, I'm not a commercial expert. Ben, do you have any feedback to give on this deal? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to say that as far as soil work, goes especially in an area like ohio we've i've done some development work on some development in virginia so it's a similar ish but i think ohio may be just a little bit better soil yeah. soil work can get pretty expensive so any end user that's going to be looking at a site like you have to think like like Sumner said there's a very there's a very finite amount of end users for a space like that you know is it going to be is it commercial? So that you know, is that is that a high density multi-family commercial, or is that you know a retail strip? And then you you have to think, okay, what's the feasibility for that? What's the end demand for the end user? Uh, you know, it's going to really limit it. And then you really just you, know, you look at what your total cost is and back into what a, you know, find the land would be profitable for that for that end developer. And then with this with the soil work, that's going to be a majority of the construction cost, and it's. It, you know, it could get, I see, which is probably why a lot of people looked at the site and said, oh, this is the soil works going to cost a lot. I either needed, I either needed a pretty big discount in order to pay for it, or I need a long option period. And really study and wrap my head around the, the total cost and feasibility because, you know, other developers are were probably looking at the same thing. It's like, hey, you know, let me put it off, you know, get a long escrow period on it. And uh, while well, I can go pay like a few thousand dollars for the soil study, uh, and that way I'm not, you know, they're only out, 
you know, five, ten thousand dollars in, in dead deal costs versus having to pay seventy thousand dollars and find out that you know, they have to pay to, to stabilize the soil and just blow the whole project up. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. That's really good advice. One thing to tack on to that too. So when I'm looking, this is tangential, but when I'm looking at owners that have previously listed a property before. So think about it, like we're, we're dealing with typically in this business, like a B to C transaction, right? I'm selling to Joe Schmo end user who's going to go pull his RV out there and shoot his guns. This is more of a B to B transaction. I think these, these markets, like a commercial lot, I can't imagine in this town value has increased exponentially from 2019 till now. But when it's a B to C transaction, I've seen that these markets can be a little more fluid. Like it can change a lot for what someone's willing to pay for a deal. So we've bought deals that was listed by either a realtor or the owner for you know, FISBO. And then they had it listed a couple of years ago. We buy it from them and we're able to sell it. And I think I can change, but I would reckon being if there was five or 10 players that were interested in this market, if they didn't like it in 2019, it's hard to think that a lot has changed there. And I'm not like a macroeconomist. I really don't know. But I would think it, that those developments and areas can take a long time to shift. And so I'd be shocked if in four years, it's become a, a prominent market that people want it. You know, get 70K, it's like, that's a pretty smoking hot deal, I'd have to think. Uh, and prices have appreciated for land a ton since 2019. But I don't know if for a developer to come in, like, they're not just looking at this town's appreciated. They're looking at like job growth and population growth. I don't know if that stuff has really increased that much in 2019, 2019 till now. That would actually be an interesting data point to go look at. I look at the population growth, look at the average median income, look if there's any job growth. Because if the stuff has changed more kind of a macro level for that town, well, hell, maybe there is more value in it now, you know? But I would have to guess that some of the few buyers that were, were a good fit for it looked at it in 2019. There's probably a reason they turned away from it. And so I think the option contract's the angle here. Okay. All right. Thank you, Sonmer. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. Yeah, for sure, man. That was a long-winded answer, but that was a good one. That was good. Um, ben and Damon, I'm going to get to you guys here in one sec. We got a question that was submitted in the chat that I'm going to answer. So our friend Arlen said, Sup, Sonmer, appreciate you taking the time to do these. Uh, just curious, certainly just come around to me after you go through the hands up. Us. Uh, okay, I'll do you first, Arlen. He said, if you could go back, what would you say to your younger self starting in this business? I seem to be in a similar position you were in. I've set around $7,000 for myself to start land investing. I've just got my first set of mailers ordered, design approved, and scheduled to be sent out soon. Just looking at the best ways to prepare, I've got the general idea, but could use some more direction for learning. Staying stupid hungry, I love that. So most definitely will be looking into your mentorship as I earn a little cash comfort. Truly think that's the best and fastest way to learn for sure. If you want to throw some shameless selling on top too, that would be sweet and fair. To say I'm 18, I'm favoring your team scaling strategy versus becoming uh, a one-man army. Thanks again for all the advice. Okay, great question, man. I, yeah, it's funny, I get this question a couple of times a week and I feel like such an idiot answering it. And I swear to God, I'm giving you my best unbiased answer. I'm really not trying to sell to you. But I'll tell you my, my genuine feedback. If you asked me this before I started, Lee, I would have told you the same exact thing. I spent two years with the hubris levels at maximum 10. Like I was just so gung ho that I could figure this out. I think part of that was because I had run businesses previously. And so I was like, oh, I could start a business. I could figure this out. And frankly, some of that stuff that I learned previously from other businesses did help. And it definitely gave me a little bit of a leg up. But I spent two years doing the stupidest things. I mean, like I was buying deals that I was buying for 5,000 and selling for 5,500, buying landlocked properties, properties with title issues. I mean, I knew nothing about the actual land side of things. Maybe I knew a little bit about business, but even that, my, my knowledge was pretty limited. And so if I look back, rewinded the tapes, and we did a parallel experiment, and we ran out that case study, and we ran out the case study where I said, hey, you know what? I don't know shit. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go find someone who I want to emulate. There's three ways I think you can do that. You can go and get an apprenticeship, which I think is an undervalued route. Go work for a land investor. It could be for free or it could be paid. We've hired many people doing that. We've got Jay's looking for someone currently. We've got many people that have done that. I think it's a really good way to learn. You're literally getting paid to learn. The second thing is you can go and take a course. That's a little more dependent on you adhering to it. The completion rate uh, for industry averages for courses in general is about 30%. A lot of people, they just don't see it through. But if you know yourself, then you, you know you know make the decision off of that and, and stick to it or like some kind of coaching component. 
And so when my business took off two years in is when I hired a mentor and things just went like parabolic from there. So I think if we, if we ran out that, that same story in a parallel world, what would happen is I would have delayed my first mailing because I didn't have that much money. So I would have gone and paid someone. But the thing is, I had income coming in from a job. So every month I could shell out about $1,500 from my job. That's the part of the story that I guess I really don't tell is that I spent seven grand and really not much happened. And so then I had to go draw money every month, 1500 bucks or so for my, for my W-2 and, and start throwing that in, right? Because I just didn't know what I was doing. And so if I, if I play that out in a parallel universe, one, I remove a lot of the risk. I remove a lot of the pain. And, I, and I'll tell you a few stories. I really got lucky in a lot of senses, but I think my efforts compound faster, right? I usually tell someone, if you're doing this business solo, no education, expect six to 12 months to get your first deal. If you're in some kind of education environment, 90 days to 120 days is a little more typical. I would pay for speed. Even if that means I'm gonna have to delay my mailing a little bit, I'd pay for speed and I'd pay for a sure thing. So that's my story. And frankly, I think I got really lucky. Every month we get, I don't know, three to five people that call in that are kind of in this, they're in this state where it's like they're on life support in their land business. When we get, I had a guy that called in that spent $100,000 on direct mail and had zero deals. Andy Barlow spent 40, or sent 40,000 mailers, put his life savings on the line and got zero deals. We had a guy uh, on Monday, spent 25 grand, had zero deals. And so whether it's education or not, I mean, I would advise going that route. But even if you don't go that route and you say you're going to do it on your own, I would recommend delaying your mailing as much as you can. Because if you got to look at it like this, you got a few bullets in the chamber. You want to take those shots really wisely. So I think a lot of people are, are I want to get the phone to ring. I want to get leads coming in. And frankly, it's because people paint this business as being simple and it is simple, but it's not easy. I think anyone in this room can attest to the fact that they're doing deals. This business is not easy. It's very simple though. And so I would just say, whatever you do, if you've got a few bullets in the chamber, get education or delay sending that out and try to get in the right rooms. There's free ways to learn, bother people, cold email people, get in discord, try to find an apprenticeship create a buddy system, right? Go find someone that's one step further than you or the same step and work together. There's a really interesting phenomenon that happens. Arlen, let's say that you are one and let's say you get two people in a room. You think the totality should be two, but in fact, it's three or four. Like collective thinking is, is really powerful. And so trying to create some kind of accountability and getting a second pair of eyes on the work that you're doing, um, it would be really advisable. So yeah, man, it's it, it's tough advice because it's like, yeah, I pulled it off. I did it, but it took me two years. That's a freaking long time. Anthony Reese just left this call, but Anthony Reese came in zero real estate experience, came in and then 90 days locked up two deals. They're going to make him 150K, no money out of pocket to buy those deals. And he's just been using his bartending job to cover his cost of mailing. So he put his lump sum towards education, bartending funds towards mailing. I think that's a pretty wise way to skin the cat because you really don't need to drop 7K now on mailing. You'd need 1000 to $3,000 a month to float you over a 90-day period or so to get that first deal. And then you're playing with house's money. So I swear to God, that's an unbiased response. I'm really not trying to pitch you. It could be me. It could be anyone else. Delay that mailing and get education or get a buddy, get apprenticeship, get some kind of support would be my best, my, my best two cents to you. Um, outside of that, there are a lot of good material. There's a lot of good material online too. So I, I'm sure you watch some of the YouTube videos, but I mean, sometimes it's about rewatching videos or watching all the videos or finding other videos online. You know, when I first started and it wasn't perfect, I went onto Facebook and I went to the land geek Facebook group and I found a back door to get, uh, access to the recorded calls. They used to like put up links, to the recorded calls. I watched every recorded call from them. I went to Land Academy, Jack and Jill. I watched every video they ever produced, which I think is damn near over a thousand videos. And even then it didn't set me up perfectly, but it gave me a decent enough launch pad. So get really hungry and consume information and delay the action, which I think for most people in most business environments, they need to do the opposite, right? Most people when they're starting a business, they're in this paralysis analysis trying to learn and they never do. The problem is our doing has a lot of risk associated with it. So I would, I would delay the doing. Arlen, I hope that helps, man. If you need any support, drop a note in Discord. I always tell people, use and abuse the community, right? Ask questions, get involved. 
and answer other people's questions, right? One of the best ways to learn is by teaching. And that sounds ironic, even though you're just starting, but providing your two cents can be valuable. So hope that helps, man. Hope to get on a call with you in a year and you're, you're kicking ass and taking names. So uh, keep at it, man. I think you're 18. I'm not positive, but if you are, that's that's insane. I wish I started when I was 18. Uh, Mr. Benjamin, I know you've been uh, on hold for a minute there. So let's, let's get to your question. No, all good. Um, so I'm sh shifting gears. I, I know I only could catch like maybe 20, 30 minutes of the uh, of the call you had in the leader group yesterday as far as building out the team yep. goes. And I, the, my question is, you know, how do you, how does your day to day, week to week cadence go with your team and checking in? Like how you know on a on a day to day, where do you check in? It's like okay, you've got your KPI set. Like who are you who are you speaking with more frequently? What yep. what goals are you tracking? What you know what meetings are you having with, with the team? And what what are you trying to get as the uh, as the owner CEO of this of your land? Business? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, dude, I don't know if you missed this part, but it's it's actually pretty crazy how distant I've become from my business. I think especially as, I, as I've started up Leah, I mean, I probably work in my business an hour a day or so. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's a testament to building good systems. And that, frankly, for a while, that kind of scared me. I'm like, felt negligent, but everything is <laughs> still humming along. Um, so everything kind of works. I, again, I said this yesterday. I don't know if you, if you heard me say it, I'll say it again. I think hierarchies can be dangerous and that can lead to abusing people. If we look at a hierarchy for a population, that could be unfortunate, but in running yeah. a business, it has to be hierarchical. Like there has to be a hierarchy there. So I don't get all the information. It just flows through a stream that gets pre-checked by each person and then finally makes it to me. So if I showed you guys my, I'll share my screen here. I don't know if this will be relevant because you're driving right now, Ben. Um, so on a day to day, I'm inside Slack. So like this stuff that's making it to me is of importance. And then I'll check some of these key channels, right? If we go like sales offers, okay, we got some offers that my team is reviewing and you see like my team is going through There's 57 replies in this offer that we just got. They're going through and they're bouncing ideas off each other, spot checking this, this purchase agreement that we got. And then if they have big questions or red flags, that'll get routed to Newman and then that'll get routed to me. But we really try to have everyone work amongst themselves. And then if it needs to be escalated, it gets ex escalated to Newman. Then if Newman really feels like it needs to get to me, it gets to me. So I'm inside Slack. I answer, you know, a couple dozen messages a day, but nothing excessive. My team runs a sales meeting every single day. So five days a week, Newman runs that. So it's for disposition and acquisitions uh, and any of the ancillary roles that support them, like our texting manager and stuff like that are on those calls. That's been really, really powerful for us. I don't I don't join those, but uh, I join our Wednesday calls. It's kind of like our all hands meeting. Uh, yeah. Wednesday's a weird day to host it. I actually don't know why we do it on Wednesday. It's probably better to do it on a Monday or a Friday, like to recap the week or to fire everyone up on a Monday. So frankly, I don't know why we did a, did a Wednesday. Um, so I joined that call on Wednesday. Uh, I review KPIs once a week. So we have acquisitions disposition sheet. So I'll review all the stuff that's in there. I'll review our general KPIs, then I'll review our acquisition KPIs. So yield from mailers, ROAS from you know texting and, and mailing and stuff like that. Um, and then my team uses a lot of um, tagging. So like they'll tag me in deals or in leads via follow-up boss. And so I do spend a lot of time uh, working with my acquisition team, mainly my acquisition guy that's on the subdivide side of things. Uh, one, because I, I mean, I love looking at deals, and so I, I really want to be included in that. But also, these deals have they're, they're a little more complex for one person to underwrite, um, and so I, I probably get tagged in two to four deals a day that I go through and review. Um, I'll look at once a week or so. I'll go through and look at stats side, follow up boss for communication, talk time, number of calls made, number of new leads, stuff like that. But yeah, it's pretty minimal um, the the time involvement in my business at this point. Um, but you know, I go through, it's, it's definitely seasonal and not literally the seasons of the business, but seasons of life. So right now I'm in a season right now, but we're pretty much in maintenance mode. So let's maintain, we'll continue to grow at that clip. And I'm really doubling down my effort in other areas, but seven months ago, it was all hands on deck. I had to figure out the subdivided thing and build processes around that. And so like we talked about a little bit on the call yesterday, it's like, there has been like four, three or four inflection points in my business where like as a CEO, I was looking six to 12 months ahead and said, this is the thing we're going to tackle. I get very involved, build a system and then let it play out and kind of step back a little bit. 
So odds are what I'm doing now, my, the intensity might ramp up six months from now. And I always think about, I don't know if anyone here is a fan of Naval Ravikant or read any of his work. The Almanac of Naval is a phenomenal book. Really recommend it. Um, he's got this saying that I think is so apt to, to kind of how most of us should be working. You know, once you're out of that kind of like hunt to kill mode and you're doing everything yourself and you're starting to create leverage in your business, you really want to start looking at, am I, am I grazing? And grazing would look like being like a cow, right? Am I answering emails all day? I'm on calls all day. I'm slacking people all day. You're just doing a lot of stuff, but very little of it moves the needle. And really when you're in that mode, it's so hard to be a visionary. It's so hard to step out and look forward and look at big objectives. And frankly, you owe it to your team to give them those opportunities. And that only happens if you're sitting in the seat as the visionary. And so instead of grazing, which I used to do horribly, man, I had like a lot of my self-worth wrapped up into work. And so if I wasn't busy, I felt like I like I would get like, like ugh, stressed about not working. It was a weird phenomenon. And instead, working like a lion. So if you looked at like a lion, what do they do? They go after a really big kill, a really big initiative. They feast and then they relax. And so the only way I've been able to take on big projects, big tasks is by giving myself that freedom. And so having some periods where it's kind of, it's undulating. So right now it's a very chill mode. So yeah, it's really managing KPIs. It's addressing stuff that gets kind of routed up through the hierarchy. It's our Wednesday call um, and trying to find more money, <laughs> which I'm doing a pretty bad job of right now, honestly. I could be doing better on that front. Does that help answer the question, Ben? Yeah, that was awesome. That, that was perfect. Cool, man. Yeah, and this is like, we, oh, I would recommend watching the call. Yeah. Uh, it's recorded. I would re recommend watching the call. It's getting uploaded today. Yeah. Going through yeah, and watching yeah. that one from yesterday. You know, really, if I distill down what should we be doing as the CEO, and you can use this to cross-reference what you're doing now and say, okay, A, am I even doing those things? Because if I'm not, let me add those to my plate. And then B, am I doing way more than that stuff? And if you are, start to try to peel that off and delegate and create a system around it. Um, but really like, again, spending time thinking, I know that's crazy to say, but like thinking, being, looking forward, spending time reviewing deals. So I call it blessing deals, not reviewing deals. Let my team get it in a place where it's ready to give a yes or a no. I don't want to DD a deal. I want a deal to come pre DD to me. And I say yes, or I say no. Um, for some of you guys, you, you will do that with offers. I pretty much trust my team entirely for acquisitions and dispositions to accept an offer or make an offer. I pretty much put no breaks around that. That took time to get there. Um, the next thing is reviewing KPIs. And the next thing is finding money. That's really it, man. And like that really does not take, should not be a 40 hour work week thing if you're working effectively. That takes time to get there, but I think that's kind of the North Star to work towards. Um, so, but frankly, like there's a counter argument to this, which is that's dude, goal. I'm yeah. doing this business and I don't want to free myself up from looking at deals. And I feel that a little bit as well. So I still am probably overly involved at looking at subdivide deals. Cause I just, I like it. So. Cool. Um, yeah, that was, that was a good, that was a good help and primer as far as like planning out six, 12 months for, for myself. Right. Yeah. Like that's. Yeah exactly what i was trying to, to get at so i appreciate that yeah man hey where are you headed right now by the way <laughs> home i've been commuting oh, okay this okay cool um yeah. all right mr damon i know we've been keeping you waiting man no no worries no worries can you hear me all right yeah i got you loud and clear perfect um so a lead came in today and it's it's a situation to want your opinion on it's it's one parcel okay. but it's two squares that meet at a corner Okay. With a 20 foot easement, basically from one, you know, one parcel over the corner to the other parcel. Okay. The, there is road access to one parcel and it basically, the road ends at that parcel. So the other one is essentially landlocked to some degree, except for that easement. And I guess the question would be, in, is really about uh, number one, valuing it. And then number two, you know, is it, is it, worth looking at a play to you know bring in a road crew and you know extend that road through the one property across the corner and then physically divide them up sell them separately i mean what do you do when you run across something like yeah. that so uh, before we address it let's talk about in your assessment what are these properties worth how big are they and where are they 
Uh, okay, so 37 acres roughly each, so 75, 74 total. Um, they're, you're familiar with this area, they're north of Weston, Colorado, um, Los Angeles County, which is it, this specific, this Borough Canyon, which is specifically probably a 15 to $1,700 market uh, per acre. Okay. Um, the agree or the offer was $800 an acre offer. So, and that's my question is, you know, if there are two separate parcels with two separate accesses, you know, it would, the, the pricing seems to make sense, yeah. but, you know, to pay 800 bucks an acre for 74 acres and really 37 of it is kind of the main parcel and the other is just the little, you know, offshoot that, you know, is landlocked unless you own the one parcel, that's kind of the situation. Yeah. Do you, do you mind if we get in the weeds? Could you share the APN so I could pull it up and we could go through yeah. it all together? Yeah. It'd be helpful to get a visual. I, I mean, I, I know what you're talking about, but it is a little hard yeah. to get a clear read on. So I want to make sure I give a fair advice. You want to put that in the chat? Yeah. My, my first thing though, and we'll, we'll talk about it as we get this pulled up. I would I'd be hard pressed to imagine a situation where it makes sense to do any kind of road improvements. Hey, see you, Ben. Thanks for joining man. Um, yeah, it'd be hard pressed to see a situation where it makes sense to do any road improvements on this. So that I feel pretty skeptical on. Um, there is an easement, though. So this is in Los Angeles County. Yes. Okay. So there is an easement. Um, it doesn't sound like it's going to be too terrible. So I think I think as is, there's probably still value. But let's just go confirm. This is a market I like too. I like Weston. It's a pretty area. Didn't you say? Didn't you say you owned a property out there? Yeah, and I, I own some land in Picket Wire, which is east of this. Oh, dude! I, did I tell you I sold a, a, a deal? Or, no, yeah, I sold the deal in Picket Wire, and we actually have one listed right now. If I know, I, I drive by your. In fact, I'm going to drive by the one you got listed tonight. <laughs> <laughs> no way! Yeah. Yeah. dude, that's so cool. Hey, is it a nice property? It is. Okay. Uh, it's the the road getting there is a little sketch off yeah. the main road, um, and it's tough to tell if there's access from the north, but from the south. Um, it, it it seems a little bit topographically sketch, but yeah, there's some flat stuff down at the bottom. Yeah, we're yeah, It's a little <laughs> steeper than the other one that we sold. I think someone will still buy it, but yeah. you go out there on the weekends just to hang out. Yeah, my family yeah. and I just kind of go down and ride UTVs and screw around. Ah, uh, I re you know it's so funny. I so I mean like I fell in love with Southern Colorado and this land business like more so than any place. So those are where I first started doing a lot of deals like. Alamosa County, Costilla County, and yet I've never been there. And so it's been a, actually Michael Bull and I have talked about doing a road trip out there. We've come out. probably done a hundred plus deals there. Yeah, um, come out. We'll, we'll yeah, man, we'll have to go drive some ATVs or go rip some dirt yeah. bikes. But <laughs> the Sangre de Cristo is like, that is such a beautiful mountain range to me. So I'll, I'll have to let you know when I make it out there. And the Spanish peaks, the two, the two peaks. Yeah, yeah. it's awesome. So this this lot here, um, owned by Mr. Hill, I think. Yeah. So, Fletcher Hill. Okay. What you said? There's a second lot that's connected to it. Well, it. So if you, I can't see your screen, but if you look. Oh at, my bad. Oh sorry, guys. I always do this. It make, makes for the worst content. You know, so I don't even share my screen for you guys. Let me do that. Here we go. Okay. So the the one you've got is yep. so down to the bottom and right this yep yep sorry i'm trying to, yep that one so those yeah. two are actually one parcel according to county oh interesting yeah i've noticed there's some mapping issues in los Angeles county they, yeah. they get a little screwy sometimes okay that, that's why this lady's so interested is i think people are mailing this wrong yeah yeah because you can see right here here's the, the lot area yeah so this is is this over 100 acres or is it 70 acres what's the story 30, it's 36 each 37 each. okay Okay, cool. And you got it at 800 an acre. Um, okay. what, what's the actual price on that? So I don't have to do public math here in front of everyone. Oh, it's one. like uh, 50, hold on, I'll tell you. 58, 59. Okay. okay. Yeah, so I would not I, I would not do any road work on this. I don't think anyone's really going to care. And frankly, this, this thing looks pretty steep right here. Let's go look. Yeah, parts of it. And again, I, I don't think anyone's going to be concerned about that. I, and I think that, you know, let's just say we list this at a at hundred. I don't think there's anything competing with you at a hundred out here for this no. size. 
My one concern actually more so is the road getting to it. The actual road looks a little I've been on it. It's not bad. Oh, really? Okay. okay. And I'm actually going to walk it tomorrow. <laughs> okay, sweet. Uh, well, dude, if I ever have some deals for you to, to walk, yeah. I'll, I'll hit you up <laughs> here in the area. Yeah. Yeah, so this one would be this would be too, way too crazy to do anything on, but this is I, this is no big deal in the slightest. I like this little building pad they have right here too. This is this is a nice property, man, with the uh, views of the the river. Yeah, that is a river. Views and of the you, river. You can see the Sangres from both both. Oh yeah. Possible, There's the Spanish Peaks. Yeah, this is awesome. Oh, I like this property a lot. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's go. Let's go price it out though. Let's just go look at some comps on this. I think you got a slam dunk of a deal, though. Really cool that you get to go walk it. If you get some photos of it, uh, share it with the group. Am I spelling that wrong? Yeah, there we go. Ba -ba -ba. Yeah, this this must be a mispriced issue for the offer she's been receiving because this looks really good. She bought it in 1990. Her house burned down a couple of years in a fire here in the Denver area, and she's rebuilding it right now. And oh, gosh. <laughs> so yeah look at we've got this uh how far is that from us okay so we've got this lot it's a little bit northish of us i think or maybe west i'm not quite sure this 40 at 115 yep. uh, this has been up for 45 days um i mean for the area that's probably pretty pretty expensive i would think but let's go see what's selling There's not a lot of activity in here. Yeah, I know. We're going to have to draw some assumptions. I figure there's not, not a lot of comps back here. So we've got this 40 at 66.9. Looks like it's got a gate on it. LS, LDS. Oh, dude. Yeah. Not to get in the weeds, but look at the pictures on this one. <laughs> what, in 2021? Is there something specific I should be looking for? Scroll. Uh, wait, go back one. Keep going. Okay, stop. Nope. Yeah. Oh, one more. Sorry. Hold on. Shit. So look on the right. Oh, that person. <laughs> she's, she's pulled her pants. <laughs> oh my God. Dude, that's hilarious. <laughs> I wonder if that comes included with the property. That's so funny. <laughs> Good eyes, man. Good eyes. I would have scrolled right past that. So this sold, oh, this took two years. My God, yeah. that took a long time. Yep. Yeah. Uh, um, so here's two for me, right? Here's one for me, one for me. Here's one at 79 for a 40. Uh, do you know Primero Ranch? Have you ever heard of this one? Yep, yeah, I do. Is, is it nice? It's Yes, it's nice. Uh, the difference is it's very similar in terms of terrain. The difference is it's gated and it has okay. a two-way. Okay. So yeah. we could assume this is probably a little more valuable or or, you, or do you think it's not going to swing price? I, I, yeah, much? this is what, two grand an acre? I think yeah. it is more valuable okay okay cool and this took six months to sell um and i sold at the price listed sold at 65 in 2021 it got turned twice pretty close pretty close together um all right let's go take one more look at the for sale then we're going to zoom out and start looking around in the larger area we're probably going to have to draw i think this is a landio list listing right there they always have the best photos then we're going to have to draw some uh assumptions from these which if we're looking at a 40 trading at 79 when I mean, you got to think a 70 at 100 i mean that's just got to fly off the shelves but let's go zoom out a little bit you know frankly for someone like you you know the difference of bond carbo and versus weston might be might be a big difference but for joe schmo buyer who wants to own land in southern colorado they might not really care and frankly you might be competing with kind of the totality of listings in this little area so let's go look at for for big stuff. What do we have in terms of competition across the board? So we'll go price low to high. Um, a lot of forties, of course. We got an eighty at three eighty five. Oh yeah, this is such this is such a good deal. I like this deal more and more. Um, yeah, dude, this is amazing. I, I mean, frankly, it could probably sell for more than 100. I don't know. And maybe you want to start a little high and start a step down. Okay. Uh, I might be selling you a little short there. But our worst case scenario is 100, and you are so protected on that 100 deal. And now is the time to do a deal like this one before it gets all snowy out there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dude, this is great, though. This is such a good deal. Don't change a thing about this. 
just okay. get get great photos. I actually have a great uh, photographer contact if you need one that does all of our stuff out there or some okay. of our stuff out there. Um, but this is really good. And what he will do, his name is Mark Elliott, if anyone's ever used him. He will go and do drone videos. He'll make like a really polished, edited, cool video. And he'll add like text and description about what he saw on the property. He'll do drone photos. He'll do lot lines. And he straps a GoPro to his car and films the whole entire drive out there and makes a directions video. So he'll make a directions video from like, you know, some Weston, let's say, or a more common kind of middle ground and show people how to get there. It's really cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, this is a great deal, man. I'm fired up for you on this one. This is going to be a fun one. How much mail did you have to send to get this deal? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to say this to jinx myself, but <laughs> this is my first mailer. It was 967, and this would be my third deal out of that mailer. <laughs> the testament to good pricing, though, right? You know this area really well, I'd imagine. Well, and that's so. just it. And it was it was a comfort mailer. Because I know the area, I'm there all the time. So yeah. it, it, I don't, I'm not putting any sort of faith in my pricing ability based on this, but it, it's working out okay. Yeah, dude, that's awesome, man. Well, I'm, I'm really happy for you. Justin and I always joke that Damon's the nicest guy in land investing. I don't know why, but you, oh, are, really? <laughs> you deserve a good deal, man. So kudos. Thanks. Appreciate it, bud. Yeah, of course. Uh, all right, Mr. Owens, back on the, back on the mic, back on the ones and twos. <laughs> yeah. I had a quick question, but I do also want to say uh, to Damien, like it's it's definitely more, well, I guess I can say it, but more common than you think to get a deal on your first mailer because uh, I sent 75, 75 pieces and um, I sent, I think, 26 to one zip code and that zip code gave me four leads. I only just oh sweet <laughs> yeah and, and then one of those leads actually ended up being my first my first deal and it was assignment but um, hey, it was something. It was proof of concept for me. So I was like, all right, I got to go all in with Sumner. All right, um, let me tack on. Let me tack on one thing to that. You can tell me if I'm wrong. Yeah. But in both those cases, I know for Damon this is true, but for you, wasn't that an area you were somewhat familiar with? Yeah, that's actually funny. It was. It it's like 30 minutes for me. Yeah, and I think there's a lot to be said about that. Not so much that you need to know an area. Who gives a hoot about that? But. Because you know an area, you typically are a little more apt to figure out pricing and, and you might even already know pricing. And so I, I think it really speaks to nailing down your pricing. And that is the magic of doing small mailers. I don't know if Donald's still on the call, but like that's the power of doing small mailers is you can get ridiculous yields like that. It's I would say it's rare to have that happen on your first mailer. It's not rare to have that happen in general though. And if we look at why our ROAS or I guess more our yield from our mailers gets compressed over time is because to scale my marketing, I've got to go and find new markets. I can't go drop 20,000 mailers a month or 40,000 mailers a month to the same areas I've been working at. It's just not, not possible. And so if I want to grow, I've got to go find new markets. And in that growth process, naturally, I'm going to get my pricing wrong and my yield from my mailers is going to lessen. So we always talk about you know, getting a deal for 2000 letters or 1700 letters, 2500 letters, somewhere in that range, depending on the member. But if I actually isolated my mailing results from markets that I know, it's like, it's like a, a deal per 1200 letters or 1100. So uh, a testament to knowing your pricing, but it, that is rare that happens on your first go because typically people don't, don't know pricing. Anyways, yeah. I digress. All right. All right. What you got? Well, you don't have to digress too much. I, I, I'll just say, um, I'll go with you a little bit because um, just on the same thread, the subdivide deal in Creek County, I mean, that that was my first Leah uh, mailer. So, so yeah. I mean, it, it, yeah, I mean, I've driven through it a couple of times, so I, I'm a little familiar with how beautiful it is out there, but, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's, it's just also touching those leads again or touching those properties again by sending more mail. And I, I didn't realize that you shouldn't mail every quarter, like once a quarter at that point. So I had mailed them twice um, out of probably five mailers at the time. Yeah. So, I mean, maybe that helped too. I don't know. Um, my question though, is actually rewinding a little bit when you were talking about what you do on the day-to-day -day and what your week looks like. I'm more actually curious about your team because I think the goal is to be where you're at, but I'm curious how you structure your team schedule to a degree. Like if you hire a journalist VA, at least in my position, um, am I expecting them to work 40 hours a week or is this like a part-time gig? Like, I don't want, I don't want to 
hire someone, pay them, you know, I'm not familiar with, <laughs> with the pay in the Philippines, but pay them an in incredible amount to not do too much, but I don't want to give them uh, too little for what they're doing. So is this for any role or just for a generalist VA? I mean, it's, it, it really is for any role, but it starts for me uh, with a GA. I, I just, or a VA, excuse me. I, I just, uh, I can't see myself giving someone 40 hours of work. And if I can, I mean, I'm just trying to imagine what I'd be doing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, first off, I, it's funny going through the the call yesterday, I was sitting and thinking after, after we all finished up. And I actually feel like this often <laughs> on a lot of these calls. I'm just saying, thinking to myself, damn, there was so much more I had to say on that matter. <laughs> it's really because, especially when we talk about team building, I mean, I could talk about it for a long time, but there's a lot to cover there. One of the things that I wanted to address yesterday, though, is that when I was telling you guys the two different archetypes for hiring, so you've got your FTEs, full-time employees, and you've got like the contractor types. What I don't like saying is people that get them confused and they'll have FTE type roles, but they have them working part-time. I don't think that ever works. I'm a real big proponent. If it's going to be a part-timer, uh, you're not going to have a part-time generalist VA. You're going to have a part-timer that does a portion of whatever generalist VA would do, right? So they're going to go and scrub your data. They're going to go and find your markets, whatever it may be. But I don't like someone that says, I'm going to have a part-time acquisition manager. Just, I have never seen it play out. Um, so the truth is, I mean, on one hand, yeah, you might incur a little bit of cost if you have someone at 40 hours, but you're going to get a better candidate. You're going to get buy-in from them. Um, and so, you know, maybe for the first few weeks, you don't have enough work for them. But the goal is to get someone in, let's say in the case of the General's VA, to free you up to create more opportunity in your business, therefore giving them more to work on, sure. therefore being able to go hire more people. So you're talking about a very small lapse in time. Okay. Uh, you might be paying them an extra $300 a month that you really don't need to. Um, but that's on one hand. I think there's truth to that. But more that's common, if I look back at my first time hiring, or my first few times hiring, this was a recurring thought that I had. I don't have enough work for them. What if they rip me off? What if I'm overpaying? Yeah. What if like all this negative self-talk? And what I found is when you bring someone on, it's like you start, especially as you start delegating, you start realizing the power of it. And you're like, dude, I could delegate this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. And then soon they're like, I can't take on anymore. You keep on giving me too much to do. So I'd be be shocking if you if you didn't have 40 hours of work for them. Maybe not now. I, I, where sure. you're at, I would not encourage you to. I think you're more in a position where it might make sense to have a contractor who's doing pieces of the business for you, but not a contractor wearing the hat of a role of a full-time person. Does that make sense? So yeah, like, it does. It yeah, does, I don't yeah. like, I don't, I, I've never seen that work. And frankly, it's like a realtor that's willing to take a 1% commission. It makes you ask some questions. Why are they willing to do that? It's the same thing. Like if you're such a grade A player, which when we're talking about FTEs, we're really talking about hiring skill. Like if you're not bringing in people that are good, that, not necessarily good at that thing, but just like skilled humans, right? And like we talked about yesterday, a lot of mm -hmm. what we're hiring for are more soft skills, but they got to have those skills there. So if they are a grade A player, you got to think about this in terms of a marketplace, why is someone else not picking them up? Why do they not have the opportunity to get a full-time job elsewhere? If they're willing to take a part-time job with me and they've got all these skills and they're really a good candidate, that's actually a big red flag for me. So I think a lot of the A players on my team would never have taken a part-time role. So like by virtue of searching for that, you start whittling down the candidates and you're kind of looking at the worst of the worst at that point. So I think you'll know when it's time to hire. I don't think it's now, but I think when you do, that might still be a recurring thought. And I'll walk you through that. Right now, I'd say, Ari, it's not time to hire. But when it's time to hire, you even sure. might have trepidation, but I'll tell you with certainty that you're ready for it. Um, and in the event that they're burning 10 hours a week, but you've got a great player on your team, so be it. Because the goal of them is to free you up to scale. Um, yeah. So it's a very short-term thing. Yeah, I think it's going to... I I appreciate all that. I, I think I'm probably going to need your advice when it comes to... Uh, that in terms of my um or coinciding with my w2 as well because i think there's a sweet spot in terms of using the w2 for something like a loan on a home and then kind of being like all right i'm gonna dip on the w2 now don't need it um but there's also this weird um length of time where it's like okay i, I want to get to the point where i don't need to rely on the w2 yeah. but if you know i'm using it for things that i don't necessarily want to figure out right now whether that's benefits whether it's um, you know, uh, something with a, with a bank or whatever it might be. Um, 
I don't think I'll have the time to actually manage anyone. So I think there's going to have to be a trade-off uh, in some way um, where I figure out the best way to manage someone while I am working a full-time job. Yeah. 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 It's going to be tricky. I, I didn't have any employees when I was working a full-time job. It definitely would be a, a tight rope to walk. Um, I think that like the argument for W2 for house or W2 for security or W2 for more money to put in your business is kind of a farce. Yeah. Like, if we think about what are we trying to do here? We're trying to scale a business. Like it's the same thing when people give me the tax argument about not wanting to pay too much in taxes. I don't want to make too much money. Sure. I'm like, it's, a, it's so silly, right? The goal here is you're making X in your W2 right now and you're working, let's say three hours a day in your land business and you're comparing what that might be like if you leave. But the, the truth is, if you leave your W-2, and let's say in the terms of getting a loan for a house, you can't, well, I can guarantee you in two years going full-time in your business, you go buy a house for cash. Like it won't even matter. Not that you yeah. would, but that just becomes a relevant problem pretty quick. And so I think a lot of times people confuse the two and it's like, I'm going to stay in my job for security or for the income that I can put into my business. And this is exactly what I did. Um, <laughs> I got called out for it by my girlfriend at the time and it was wise <laughs> advice, but it was really hurtful. I stayed in my job for about six months longer than I needed to because my rationale was, A, I don't want to take money from the business. I've always been against taking yeah. money from businesses. I want to pour as much capital into them as, as I can. Any business I run, I like take the measly salary from it. Um, and then the other rationale was, well, I can you know set aside like 1500 bucks a month for my paycheck put back into my business so I can grow faster. Right. What I wasn't factoring in though is what what is what can I do to my business with 10 to 12 hours a day of relentless focus? I will yeah. outreturn any of the additional benefits of not taking money or the 1500. Like it will become irrelevant so quick. Um, yeah, it's really so that's point. a totally tangential point to hiring, but I'd say don't rationalize staying in your job longer than you need to. Now, there's People that jump ship too soon, that's and you got a family, and I know you're you're yeah. calculated, so that's obviously not something that you would do. There's some people that are way too quick to do it, but I think if I had to generalize, people probably hang out longer than they need to, and I was one of those people. That's super interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll definitely take that into consideration because uh, it, it's been a thought that's crossed my mind. It, actually, it's funny you say like there are some people who jump ship too <laughs> soon because that's also me. That was past me. Um, I I you know, got into wholesaling, didn't have a family at the time. And I, I used to work at a gaming company and I uh, was making really good money. And I was on, uh, you know, on the path to become uh, a very good corporate employee. And yeah. I just, I was like, no, I see what wholesaling can do. And I just jumped ship. Um, and, in, and in Los Angeles, no less. I mean, there, I, I either had to pop off and just kill every deal, every lead that I got or I was going to fail. And I just, I fell on my butt, man. So <laughs> I, I get it. I learned my lesson. Not going to do that again. That's why I think I probably err on the side of caution. Yeah. Yeah. There's wisdom in that. Uh, wholesaling in LA is no joke, man. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's a huge undertaking. Um, well, yeah, it's obviously a different dynamic when you have a family and something that I've had to tell people and something that really like helped me walk me off the ledge is, you know, all this like fear stuff starts coming up. That's like really deep rooted, yeah. Like in the human psyche, like I'm talking like evolutionary fears of like not being able to provide, going hungry, not having shelter. Like you're just thinking worst case, worst case, worst case. And everyone in this group is extremely fortunate to have been born in North America, whether it's Canada or the U.S. It's a pretty hard place to go hungry if you've got a good head on your shoulders, right? And so even in the event, like if your business crashed and burned, either getting a new job or a new starting a new business is like actually not as difficult as we make it out to be. And so I needed to play this game of, of literally like I would visualize the worst case and map out what I would do. And I was like, yeah, it's actually not that bad. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know who I'm speaking to here. It doesn't sound like I'm speaking to you necessarily, Ari, but I think it's a relevant question because I think a lot of people that are making money in a land business and have a W-2 are, are thinking those thoughts. Um, and if you've got a proof of concept, you've got a little bit of a nest egg, you can forecast in your business it's it's time but i think you, you you have a little more time there i think getting this subdivided deal done to getting your pipeline with a few more deals that's, that's also part of it's having a pipeline sure. right having yeah. revenue that you can forecast and theoretically depend on or some of it at least uh, there's really definitely helpful. a lot of tools that you've given us that uh that set you up for that success like pat live or pebble and i'm curious 
Um, one of those other things that I know you do to an extent is seller financing or financing terms. Yeah. That that's something that I was considering um, with, you know, the few, few leads that I have that I know aren't deals is like, what can I do with them to create a, an owner financing situation where at least I get some money back. And I think that's the issue is like, I'm not sure that play should, should occur initially. I think, you know, to use houses money, for example, maybe we focus on flips until we get to a point where it's like, Hey, now I can, I, I can get a bad lead and be okay with it. I can make it work. Repeat the question in terms of owner financing. No, you're, you're good. You're good. Uh, I'm. It's not necessarily a question. It's just like understanding when the best time to to actually implement that in your business is, especially owner if you're trying yeah. to, because you you wanted to use your job for that, right? Like, hey, I'll use my job's income um, to kind of push money into my business, and I'm very similar. We're using a lot of my my uh, my W two's money just straight into it, and so when is it ideal to to start doing that with owner financing deals? Yeah, dude, I, I have a real bone to pick with this. I think a lot of people think owner financing is is like a choice. And to some respect, it is. I mean, like the markets we work in, how we position our terms, how we market the deals, what platforms we are, that will influence the breakdown of how many owner finance uh, leads we get versus cash leads. But frankly, it's a tool in our tool belt that we have to use at a certain point. It's much like range offers to me, right? Sure. If I want to grow my business, at a certain point, there's some markets that I want to market to that I have to use range offers. And I just can't really sit, I can't really decide that. Uh, see you, Bridget. Thank you for joining us. Um, so as much to say with owner financing. So my playbook is you offer owner financing on absolutely every deal. Uh, it's a must. And mm -hmm. you got, when you get the owner finance sale, you've still got a fork in the road. You can liquidate that asset and sell it to a note buyer and get 80% of the value and get cash back into your business if you need to. Or you can hold that note. And what's beautiful about owner financing is you create those terms. And so a lot of our owner finance deals, see you, Arlen. Thanks for coming here, man. Um, he said, I sent you a little short headache on Discord. That's funny. Um, so the, the a lot of our owner finance sales, we get our basis back in the deal. So it's like, I mean, if I don't need that money to live on and I can take the basis and redeploy it, I'm, I'm totally happy to do that. So I don't think you have, you, you can make decisions on, the markets, the deals, how you market the property. But I think everyone needs to be offering owner financing, especially in this kind of market. Um, so yeah. I don't think it's so much of a business decision of yes or no. It's it's a yes, it's a must. But then the, the kicker there where it becomes a yes or a no is how do you design those owner finance terms? That's going to be more influence based off of your liquidity and the goals for this business, right? Because there you have a lot more latitude. You could say, hey, I'm cool with not getting my basis back for 12 months and I want to sell it quick and I want to get cash flow from it quick. Uh, and so I'm going to take a lower down payment. I'm not so, so concerned about getting my basis back. Where other people, they, hey, I want 20% down on every deal and they're trying to get their basis back. See you, David. Thanks for joining, man. Uh, have a great weekend. Um, that's where you have a little more latitude to, to make decisions. Does that make sense? So it's like owner it's financing is a must. I think like you, you can't sidestep it and then you have freedom around how you design those terms. So, so I'm curious in a, in a world where you could sell every single one of your notes for 80%. And that was always that 80% was more than you actually invested in the deal um, or more than you maybe would have gotten had you sold it cash anyway, Yeah. Uh, because you, you know, that particular deal went owner financing specifically because there's something wrong or maybe there wasn't a high cash offer in that world where you could sell every note like that. Would you? Brick? No, <laughs> no okay. way. Dude, I, my I want every no. I don't. I've never. I've never sold a note. I've been really close, and I've backed hmm. out of all of them. I never want to sell notes. I I'm in love with notes, and frankly, I like. I don't know if it's just sheer laziness, but like, you know, we've got a good thing going, and so I haven't redesigned what we're doing. But my dream is go raise ten million dollars, cheap debt, seven points a year, whatever it may be deploy all of it into owner financing and i could turn that into 50 million in probably 10 years or maybe a little bit less owner financing is the most insanely asymmetric bet for you you still essentially own the asset you can default at a moment's notice this is for yeah. land contracts you can yeah. default if they stop paying immediately 30 days a lot of our deals get sold multiple times you get cash flow from land it's a crazy return i mean like a lot of our deals at worst or a 12 month payback, but 
a lot of them are either basis back immediately or basis back in a few months. Yeah, that's a ridiculous situation to be in, and you're you're able to turn an illiquid asset into a fast turning asset. And so, like, I am so head over heels with with notes. No, I mean, like, if anyone wants to sell me notes, I'll buy your notes. I love notes, 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 notes. No, I would never sell a note. Now, the counter to that is. Well, Sumner, you could sell the notes at 80% and then redeploy the, the money back in your business and <laughs> grow from there. And yeah, there, there's truth to that, but there's a lot of complexity that comes with that too that, that might not be factored in. Sure. So to go deploy all that money for cash sales is going to be really hard. Um, uh, yeah, owner financing all day long. I'm, I'm in love with it. Got it. Uh, Ray said your longest term in all your properties is 12 months. No, no, no. So uh, Ray, I'm talking about getting my basis back. So let, let's say... Uh, we, we just sold a deal this week. That's like a seven month term. That's very rare. The guy's paying us 10 grand a month. Most of them are five years, three to five years. Somewhere in that range is pretty uh, common. I'm talking about the basis. So let's say I spend 20 on it. Let's say I get uh, 10,000 down and then I get like 800 a month or whatever that comes out to. And then I capture my basis in, in 12 months. So down payment plus, plus the cash flow over whatever time to get my basis back. So really with those, you're really looking more, oh, sorry. You're really, <laughs> I'm a little under the weather. You're looking a little bit more at IRR, internal rate of return. So less about the ROI and more about how quickly can you recapture that, that money. Um, but yeah, Ari, I, I have in my, and I ha about either starting a, a second business or steering my ship in a totally different direction and just going maniac mode on owner financing. Um, well, it's it's funny because the other mastermind that I was part of, where it was it was basically just like hardly any market research, um, just go offer on people's properties, and then sell it on owner, owner financing. Uh, the goal is just sell it to whoever you can, not to you know somebody who can can even offer cash. And so the idea is no credit check, no any due diligence on the person you're talking to other than signing a contract and then paying you. And then in that can happen through Facebook marketplace that can happen through a, uh, what do they call them? Um, a bandit sign, literally anything. And then someone calls you, you have a conversation, you email them, you owner finance it, and then you default potentially, and then you do it again. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, it's not my favorite route, but I, I can't help but see the potential of making my jobs income through it and then just continuously investing in my, my business. So, yeah. So that's a, I mean, that's a little different than our strategy. That's like the, the, the low IQ version oh, It's fucked up, but like, it's like the, <laughs> it, it is like the tell. very, very rudimentary basic oh, man. approach. Yeah. So it's like the play there is you go and buy a cheap desert square in the middle of nowhere. You put yeah. 99 down, 99 a month. You sell it to someone who's in a dire situation. Like people literally yeah. running from the cops. We sold, like, that's what we did for years. I don't like that business. And you're, you're what I don't like about that either is you've got a portfolio of like low intrinsic value junk kind of. Yeah. So for owner financing, I've, I'm, I'm more of a fan of still going the mid market route uh, or, or maybe a little bit lower. I mean, you could do like, maybe 10K to 200K kind of range. But what I've noticed with that, just like we're able to get more cash sales, we're also able to get way bigger down payments. So like on those smaller deals, we might get one to 5% of the down for the purchase price. But on the bigger deals, we're getting like 20 to 25%. Yeah. Um, and so it actually plays out, like usually it's a better uh, payback period, not always, but typically. Uh, yeah, and they're, yeah, yeah. they're much sturdier buyers. The other thing is those notes those people are creating, really can't be sold like no one really no one wants to buy land contracts and if they're going to buy them they'll buy them at like 40 or 50 percent of their value so to get 80 percent, it's got to be a great property with a big down payment and it's got to be a, a deed of trust got it yeah. good to know thank you yeah yeah of course well any more questions y'all anything else uh you guys want to work through while we're all hanging out here oh mr ray mcleod you got one more Oh, hey, Ray, yeah. I think you're uh, muted. Sorry. Hey, Ray, I think you're muted, brother. Sorry. I could have typed it out in the chat. I'm just lazy. Nice. Um, yeah. Is 
owner financing something that the Leo hard money lenders would go for? Like, would they ever be cool with recapturing their basis in 12 or 14 months? Or is that kind of not something they'd be interested in maybe for a higher? For, yeah. For so uh, hard money people is on the debt side, the joint venture side. So like hard money was nice is you've got full latitude. So like the guy, Eric, that's coming on a Wednesday, he's a hard money lender. And so you're just paying debt. So you don't get equity in the deal. And he has no say in what you do with it. So what's cool about that is you're paying one and a half percent interest a month. So you could go get a deal, sell on owner financing terms. You get your basis back in six months. You pay him off and you're paying 9% on the money. And so that's really cool. That's what's nice about debt is you, you have full attitude in what you do with the deal. When it comes to joint venture funding where someone has equity in the deal, most deal funders are not super apt to do it. I've done it with deal funders and like some will. If it's a smoking hot deal, I think it's definitely contextual. So if it's a smoking hot deal, they get their bases back quick. They can be okay with it, but I think they really want to gear people towards getting cash deals. More the the trouble with that too is managing the note. So one, if you're the guy managing the note and paying them, it's a bit of a headache. But also, what happens if you just skip dodge and stop paying them? So you're you're getting in a long term relationship that might last five years. They don't know if you're going to be in the land business in five years. So I think there's risk for them there. And then vice versa, if they're managing the note, well, then if they have to deal with all their investors, it becomes really complex. So we probably have like 10 notes with deal funders. And I've pretty much sworn that I never would want to do it again. It's just, it's a headache. It's a real headache. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm less inclined. But what I know with deal funders, is, is it just depends. And so if you get an offer that's owner financing and it's smoking hot, they'll say yes or they'll say no. I think like the, the kicker there is also the payback period. So if you get your down payment back, they might be okay with it. Um, but if it's like, hey, it's going to take 12 months, they would rather take a lower cash offer because for them, like when we look at velocity of capital, well, they look at it at a whole nother level. That's the only thing that matters. So they would rather go take 10% on the deal and then, or even break even and go do a bunch more deals. That's usually more of their mindset. Um, so that's why debt is so attractive. One, because it's way cheaper cost of capital, but, but you've got full latitude in what you can do with the deal. Um, whether it's value add, whether it's owner finance. So when I was talking about doing the big owner finance play, the only way I could do it would be with debt. Debt um, meeting a hard money guy that just wants points and doesn't care about that. He, he's sitting exactly. outside the deal. He's just yeah. an equity partner. Yeah. So the guy, Eric, that's coming on, he's like a little more of like a legit hard money lender, which we'll talk about the differences here. So he's usually looking at ideally a 12 month payback. I think you can extend. I don't think he cares too much because he's just you know accruing interest. But I think 12 months is kind of the standard. Um, it's one and a half percent a month, which is cheap relative to equity, but it's still pricey, you know, 18% a year. The best debt is private debt. So you find like a family office or a friend or a colleague, or you pool people's money together, which you need to create a fund if you do that. But what's typical there is like seven to twelve percent. Um, and then you could set the, the terms to whatever you want. And most people are really inclined to do that because it's a sure thing. You can collateralize it if you have collateral. It's probably better than the stock market right now. Um, and so people are really a big fan of that. But you won't find, uh, like by Googling hard money lenders, you'll get the guys that are like businesses and they're going to be a little more aggressive with their rates. So my dream situation is going and creating like a land banking fund so what I would like to do is go and raise, let's say $10 million that I'll pay back in 10 years. And the expectation is that I'm buying properties to hold long-term. And so either I could flip them quick, I could land bank and let them appreciate, or I could owner finance them. That's the best case scenario. The one thing you have to be mindful of though is servicing the debt. So you got to make sure is they're going to want you to pay the, the interest annually, quarterly, or monthly. And so you got to make sure you can service that debt. How would you collateralize that? Would you put that, do you put them in first lien position on the property? Yeah, so you could do that. What I would do though, and this isn't, I mean, if you're just starting, this, this it doesn't necessarily apply, but I would collateralize my note portfolio. So I think right now, uh, I think we have like 1.5 million or 1.7 million in notes. So I could use that as collateral. Gotcha. Um, but you could do, I mean, if you got any other assets, you could use that or you could give them a first lien on the, on the property, which I think might get complex at scale though. Yeah, definitely. Cool. All right. Thanks. Man. And he, this guy's going to be on Wednesday on the Wednesday. Yeah. Call? He'll be on Wednesday. So his name is Eric. So he's a note buyer. So that's actually really why we're bringing him on. So kind of to Ari's point and to my point, everyone needs to be offering owner financing. I, I just don't think it's a, a, something that you get to really decide. 
What's cool though, is what you do get to decide is cool. Do I want to hold this note or do I want to get cash in my business? And so at closing, before you even got one payment from that note, he'll buy it at 80% of the note's value. That's crazy good. That's like unheard of good. And what's happening is this market of note buyers is starting to become more efficient and there's more competitors. So people have to give better rates. So you keep the down payment, he buys the note. And what's crazy is like, in some cases, you'll actually net way more than the cash price and you'll sell it faster. The owner finance terms, like if you think land's inefficient, owner finance terms are crazy. So like we've got uh, a deal right, or a couple of deals right now to subdivide. We're listing them at 117 cash or over seven years. I think it's like, or I think it's 200K or so with interest. So if we get a note buyer on that, we'll sell that at 200 and get 160. That's a no brainer. It's way more than we could get on cash. Yeah. So it's a really cool strategy. So he does that. He does hard money lending. And then he'll actually buy out future payments. So if you've got land contracts that he wouldn't want to buy, he'll buy out future payments on those. And so then you can also get money back in your business. What is, is he wrapping these all into a REIT or does he have investors? I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter. I'm just curious. Yeah, dude, it's a good question. Um, I think I think it's his own money, to be honest. I think wow. he's well off. And I think he's probably got, a, I mean, I'm, I'm really guesstimating here. I think he's got a couple million and he makes you know, really good returns on it, probably makes 30% a year and just turns his capital. That's what I think. Or maybe he's raised a little bit of debt and he's arbitraging that. That's hard to say. Uh, but he seemed like a, like a mom and pop kind of guy. Like, I don't think it's like a, a big thing. I think like, and really he's, he's really into like, a, like the relationship side of things. So like we look at Greg, what Greg wants to do is work with every single Leah member. What he wants to do is plug in with I mean, he wants to work with everyone, but what he wants to do is pick the 10 best winners and be their go-to guy for everything for a decade. And like one good land investor could, could make him a killing. And so he's really about like building deep relationships. I don't think he's doing it at a big scale with a, well, at least with a lot of investors, but I think he's deploying a couple million dollars. It's a cool business. I mean, that's like a really interesting way to get involved. There's so many ancillary ways to make money in this business. I mean, if you've got capital, it's a great way to make outlandish returns is buying notes or, or, or deal funding. Hey, so that without a ton of work too. Sorry. What was that? No, I just said without a ton of work too. It seems yeah, like with a dude, literally, I mean, like it's, I, the deal funding space is starting to come a little more competitive, but I know some people that have been making millions of dollars a year, just funding people's deals. It's like no work, dude. All you got to do is have a funnel to find land investors. Right. That's not too difficult. It's, it's a crazy business. But over time, those rates have compressed. So joint venture in the back in the day, standard was 50-50. Now standard's like 65-35. That's going to start to raise, I think. Cool. Go ahead, Ari. It's all you yeah, you're, No, you're all good. This might be, this is on the hard lending topic, but it all, it honestly might not be for right now. If you're feeling, feeling under the weather too, uh, you might want to just keep it for after that call on Wednesday, but I just put it in the chat. I'm just really curious what this hard lending, uh, hard money lending option does for a land investor. Um, yeah, I, I put it in the chat there for you, but I feel like it can be, it can either be very dangerous or very, very lucrative. Yeah, there's risk involved. Uh, I mean, anytime you're taking on debt, there's risk involved. I typically would not advise new land investors to take on debt. Um, okay. I don't think, I mean, some of these questions in here, I don't think are true. So like, okay. is it trying to force a deal? No, I mean, again, like if you're, if, if you trust your judgment, you've been educated, I think okay. more times than not, you're probably more right than a deal funder. You guys have different buy boxes, right? And so yeah. whether it's because there's not enough margin or there's just a little bit of risk in the deal that they don't like, I, when we get deals denied that I'm like, it's yeah. a great deal. And we, yeah. had a, we had a deal in Washington that we're buying at, oh God, I can't remember. I'm, I'm going to say 25. I think it's 25. And the closest comp sold at 90. This is not the same exact property. So I think it's probably worth 70 and they turned it down because they didn't like the road act. They didn't like the dirt road leading to it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, worst case, we sell this at 50, but I think we yeah. can get a little bit more than that. So they, they got all sorts of rhymes and reasons, but that also allows you to do deals that have compressed margins. So it's like- Yeah, I was yeah, thinking well, that for the double close question there. I was yeah, like, so like buying for a 30, selling for 50, deal funders mm -hmm. don't want to do that. But with that, why the heck not? Especially in a hot yeah. market. But yeah, I mean, you got to know know your stuff, right? And so yeah. I, usually for new people, I wouldn't recommend it. One of the beauties of deal funders is they're a sounding board so they can say yes, yeah. no, and give you additional confirmation. And their due diligence is deeper than most land investors. 
but I still think they have different requirements. We're looking at different things. Would I have done that back in the day when I started? When I first started, probably not, but pretty quickly I, I, I would have. I wouldn't have gone and raised crazy amounts of money, but on one-off deals, yeah. Because you think about the worst case. The worst case is I go, let's say I do a deal and I buy it at 20. I think I'm going to sell it at 40. I end up selling it at 25 because something terrible happened. I had to pay, let's say 15% on that. So I walk away with two grand. That's like the worst. I mean, like we've got so much cushion here in most cases that the worst yeah. case ain't, ain't that bad. What's not going to happen is the deal never sells and you've got to pay them back the 25K plus 18% or 20K, whatever it was. Um, so we only do this on deals that we're 100% sure are, are fire bangers. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think, especially in this market, I think everyone should just be doing fire bangers. <laughs> I was thinking like this subdivide, for example, I was afraid it was just going to fall, fall with the, with the funders because, um, I mean, I've gotten Steve and Greg to respond to it, but it's, it's more just like, I, I feel like if I were them or in their shoes, I'd be thinking, well, a question a day, you know? It, yeah. I don't I think don't, we're not going to, if we do that deal together, we're not going to use, uh, deal funders. Right. Right. And so like when I, when I submitted it to them initially, um, they were asking smaller or like other questions, like, <laughs> like how many subdivides have you done? Yeah. And, and I'm just like, oh man, just focus on the, focus on the deal. Don't focus on me. I mean, I'm, I'm going to make it happen. I know they don't know me, but I get why. Yeah. There's merit to that question. Yeah. I mean, they're not, they're not wrong to ask that question. Absolutely. Any means there's definitely a lot more complexity to doing a subdivide. So that's the thing with, yeah. With JVers, I mean, like they they serve a great purpose, but they're not your one size fits all for everything. In fact, no public deal funder, anyone that gives you debt or anyone that funds deals for for equity, those are never going to be your guys' go to. Those are to give you guys a launch pad. They give you guys options. Like those guys in the group that are, that are, have other money, but they still lean on joint venture when they need to. It's like a really nice thing to have in your arsenal, but God no, you don't want to do that long term. Like they give you no flexibility, no creativity. They take a lot of money. Like it's like, it's not an ideal situation. So when it comes to a deal like this, I would pretty much never give up equity to a deal funder. Never, ever, ever. So this will be a, a debt route. Um, so yeah, does this make close, uh, double closings obsolete? Heck no, man. Heck no. Double closings all day. Double closings all day. No, but this would is you definitely... do this in like Colorado? Since what? you, since... I like like use hard money because nobody is apparently able to do a double close. No, that's right bullshit, now. dude. People just aren't looking hard enough. I use a realtor. We're we're doing a double close right now in Colorado. You just well, I guess the issue is uh, POA or something. Oh, are you saying instead of using like a service? No, they're talking about in Colorado. The issue is is using the flat fee MLS won't let won't let them do it. I think or something got like it. that. Got it, got it. Um, I don't know if it's a POA issue, but. Yeah, there's a workarounds for that but no yeah the only time like if you wanted to pit this up with a double closing the only time would be if there's urgency to close fast the seller doesn't want to do a double close it's such a smoking hot deal that you don't want to risk the deal with a double close okay. two none of like none of these funding strategies we've talked about here make one another obsolete they okay. all have their time there's just place. more tools yeah there's more tools but the north star that everyone should be working to this is not relevant to where anyone's at currently and minus maybe chad um the north star that everyone should eventually be working to is raising like private money like cheap money that's that's like the rocket fuel but in order to do that you need to have really clear forecasting and you need to have a track record one to even raise the money but then to even know how much do i raise what's the risk of raising that because it's pretty much going to be debt almost always and so that becomes really tricky if you're like i don't know how much i need and you raise too much you can't deploy it and yada yada yada. Um, so yeah. Got it. Sweet. Well, I appreciate the answers, man. Yeah, of course. All right. Well, we looks like we got the skeleton crew here, the stragglers. Well, I appreciate everyone making the time. Anyone have any fun plans for the weekend? No, nothing exciting. Who's who's working on their land business this weekend? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Cool guys. All right. Well, I appreciate everyone making the time. Was this fun? Was this valuable? You guys get any takeaways? Yeah, great stuff, man. What are you doing this weekend, Summer? Um, nothing much, man. I'm are you in Vegas well. now or are you back in Cali? No, I'm I'm in Las Vegas right now. So next week I'm gonna fly up to Monterey and spend some time with my mom. Um, she just got back from France. Nice. And so I want to go hang out with her for a little bit. I'm actually gonna help her move into a new house and then come back here and then move to San Diego uh June 1st. Or no, sorry, move? July 1st. Huh? 
move? I mean, temporarily. My girlfriend and I kept like a little apartment in Pacific. Oh, Beach. okay. Oh yeah, sp- spend the summer, not legit move. But um, <laughs> I was like, man, you hate it there. <laughs> no, I, you know, I'm very neutral on Las Vegas. It's not my place, but it's not a bad place. Um, you there for tax purposes? Yeah, just for tax purposes. The area we're in, I wish I could turn my computer around. The area we're in is beautiful. Like oh, that's good. literally outside of my window is just huge mountains that are like a block away. So like we're the last, the, like the last street in Vegas running up to the Red Rocks. Um, so it's really pretty, really quiet. Frankly, the people are pretty stupid here though. Like dude, the, the, yeah. the median IQ in Vegas is low. I really don't vibe with the people. It's funny um, because that's where the casinos are, man. <laughs> yeah, because you just got a lot of gambler type, strip club type. That is not my not my kind of not my dojo. Super uh, jealous you're going to Monterey though. Yeah, dude. I, yeah, I'm excited to be back. I'll, I'll have to send you guys some pictures. Monterey's the bee's knees. Ray, have you ever been to Monterey? I know you're just oh, a little north. Yeah, yeah, a bunch of times. I love Monterey. I love that whole area. Big Sur, Monterey. Yeah. It's so good, man. I'm so excited. There's no place like it. I yeah, swear I you, you get up to... there. The air is better. better. Like everything is like HD. The air is clean, clear. It's yeah. a magical place. I always, I'm a big fan of uh, Steinbeck. So I always, yeah. when I'm away, I always read so, his stuff and it makes me so reminiscent. My wife's uh, aunt actually works at the Steinbeck Center in Salinas. Uh, oh, yeah. Where, yeah. And, and Ryland, and you know, Ryland's from there. But, but yeah, yeah it's, it's actually really, it's, dude, I miss home so bad. Are you thinking I, about moving back there anytime soon? Oh, I could never do that um where are you from just, originally are you i'm from monterey yeah so oh, i didn't know that okay yeah so i just first of all tax purposes i'm already thinking like how am i supposed to get, or put aside 30 percent of everything i make in this business yeah. like yeah. that is just crazy to me so i've been talking to dennis about how to bank that into an asset and, yes. and devalue de- uh what's it called depreciate like, depreciate yeah you depreciate it and um yeah, I'm just thinking to myself, how could I go back to California, man? They've got some high taxes. <laughs> it's horrible, dude. It's horrible. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, I don't think we're going to, yeah. I, so what I think is going to happen is my parents are going to actually um, follow us. So they're going to retire in a couple of years. They're going to follow us out either to Oklahoma or somewhere else, wherever we yeah. decide. And then we're using their house as kind of a home base where we can kind of go back and forth. So, yeah, that's, that's spot on. It's exactly what I rationalized is that it's way better to be a visitor in California than to like necessarily live there. And so spend the summer there or, or whatever, visit family. Yeah. yeah. It works out to be pretty much the same or kind of, it's not the same, but it, it works out. But Ray, what I was going to say, it was interesting. So Ari's from Monterey, uh, Ryland's from Monterey. We've got like two other people that are inside the course, not inside the coaching program that are from Monterey. And then Michael Bull and colton are from the bay area so like oh those guys of, yeah really weird a lot of people from central california or northern california are they still here like michael's here, here no uh michael and colton are in san diego i don't think any of them are still in yeah. that area like uh, ryland's in florida everyone gets out for taxes or for sunny weather <laughs> you know yeah. it does get a little cold in the bay area a little foggy it's so. still freezing here man it was yeah like, dude it's, like it's today. crazy what are you in oakland i'm in oakland now yeah but i lived in san francisco for 24 years but oh, I moved wow. to LA to go work or I moved to LA for three years um and then moved back to the bay because I got the job at Lucid and they paid for me to relocate up here so I've been back since dude do you like uh Lucid cars my neighbors got one I think they're pretty badass the car itself is phenomenal okay like, better it, than a it, Tesla oh dude by I know you have a Tesla so I don't want to talk smack but <laughs> no, talk every, talk bad man I'm here by for it. every metric possible <laughs> It's a better car. Than That's what mine. I've heard. So Peter Rawlinson, the CEO, he was the chief engineer on the Model S project with Tesla. He he didn't get along with Elon. That's uh, putting it lightly. And he <laughs> started his own company. Um, so the car itself is the fact that it's their first car out of the yeah. gate and it's that good is is mind blowing. I used to take one home almost every weekend when I was working there. Oh, sick. it's amazing. Was, dude, it's eleven hundred horsepower. It's ridiculous. It's so freaking crazy. No, it's way faster than a Tesla. How do you even put that much power down to the road, though? It seems like it's torque vectoring. It's all computer nannies. Like if you took all that stuff off, yeah, nine out of ninety nine out of a hundred drivers would go straight into a ditch with that car. Like it would have too much power. But (laughs) as soon as the car starts sliding, it'll add torque to one wheel, take away to another, slow it down. It'll keep you like. 
you can be an idiot and drive that car pretty fast. Really? It'll take care of you. I want to test drive one, man. I've heard really good things. My uh, my dad's on the wait list for uh, a Rivian, which I think is yeah. pretty cool. Too. My buddy works there. Yeah. He, 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 yeah, he got an insane discount on a Rivian. He loves it. I mean, I he think they're in- badass, man. Once you drive an electric car for day to day driving, there's no argument. Like they, it is superior on every level. I will say, if you like cars, I um, mean, internal combustion engines are cool. Like the noise, the drama. A, that, that is a different experience. But for day-to-day use, oh, my God. Electric cars are the bee's knees, man. It's crazy it's taking us this long to get here. But, yeah, I, I've heard that from all standards, Lucids are, are, are better cars. But uh, as, a, as a company, they're in bad shape, man. They're hem- but I've heard, yeah. What's going on? Hemorrhaging. Well, they're hemorrhaging money, right? They laid off 25% of their workforce. Yeah. Um, they're losing. So on the first, uh, what is it, the first quarter of 23, they were upside down. I forget how many millions of dollars, but it worked out to be eight points. They're losing eight point six million dollars a day right now. <laughs> um, and it's because they weren't able to ramp up production. The manufacturing facility in Arizona is still only like 20 percent, 25 percent built out. Yeah. We weren't able to ramp that up, get cars across the line fast enough. And we're in a pretty terrible economy right now. And they're trying to sell hundred thousand dollar cars in a terrible economy. Yeah. So the sales numbers are much lower than they anticipated and production numbers, you know, production levels way down too. So yeah. dude, isn't this like the same story though that Tesla went through when they were first starting? Like for years. Yeah, dude. They were he- like everyone thought they were gonna fail. I mean it's pretty miraculous that they pulled it off. Uh, but it seems to be, I mean, if you're a new, like, electric manufacturer in the U.S., I mean, what a f- crazy feat. That's not an easy thing to pull off. I mean, no, for any not. car manufacturer in the U.S. is brand new. But, I'm, yeah, I'm rooting for all the electric cars, man. I'll have to test drive ones, but they're pretty cool. I think if, I, you make, if you make it up to the Bay, dude, I'll grab one. From okay. The- they still they still let you get one? Um, they won't let me drive it, but I'll have <laughs> my buddy. Well, I mean, they, they'll give it to my buddy, and then we can drive it once. Okay, have- okay. Yeah, dude, I want to do, um, I want to get everyone's rough idea of where everyone's at uh, with traveling coming up. I would love to start meeting people in person. It's bound to happen. I've already met a few guys in person and gone to dinner, but I mean, the Bay Area is close to me. All right, I'm sure and at one point it'll be a month. like the spot where everybody has business meetings. We should go there. And, uh... Yeah, so we're going to do, uh, we've been teasing it for a little bit, but at the end of Q3, we're going to do a meetup here in Vegas. Actually, it'll be the beginning of Q4. Sorry, the beginning of Q4 is going to be in October. Nice. So we're going to do like a little weekend hangout. So there's two different ways to go about it. And I was thinking like, ah, oh, mastermind route. That's what everyone talks about. And we're certainly going to talk land. But I think what I'm more inclined to do is a weekend of like camaraderie. So getting everyone together and just hanging out opposed to let's just talk shop all weekend. Um, and so just getting everyone here, talking shop, obviously, but like doing some fun stuff getting like an airbnb driving some cars i don't know do something fun that so sounds awesome yeah you gotta get some leah that, brand uh swag what, what's up you gotta get some leah brand swag yeah do you guys want to know something funny i gotta hop off after this i'm supposed to take my girlfriend to, on a date oh, we're supposed to leave at six go, but uh, uh i tend to get sidetracked on these calls she's always like dude why do you stay on these calls for three hours i'm like well i got a lot to say um what was i gonna say uh oh yeah so, yeah so swag. Well, one of the things that we're doing, we actually, we partner with a cookie company and we're making it, it's called a dirt cookie. And so anytime someone joins the program, they get this half dozen of dirt cookies sent to them. Uh, but I've thought about making like a t-shirt or a hat, not with like the Leah logo. I think that's boring, but like something that just a land investor would know some kind of like in, inside baseball term, I think would be pretty cool. So we'll have to, if you guys have any like land quips that you think would be good on the shirt. Yeah. Jack Bosch has these, super cheese dick like baseball hats that say um cat land cash profits or something they're so they're so horrible dude the, the marketing of like the quote-unquote competitors in this industry is just so cringe man 